Art and Caspian stood facing each other, ready to begin their match. Caspian was the leader of one of the biggest guild halls in Sapin and a double A class adventurer. Art could feel the bloodlust emanating from him, and he knew that Caspian was not going to take it easy on him. A surge of excitement courses through him despite the circumstances. As soon as the match begins, Caspian immediately launches an attack on Art. Without wasting any time, Art barely manages to defend against the assault, then he tries to counterattack. Yet in an instant, Caspian utilizes his incredible speed to maneuver behind him, but he evades the attack once more by leaping closer to him. Art then uses his momentum to slash at him. Although Caspian narrowly evades the attack just in time, he realizes that this match will be far more challenging than he had anticipated. The intense fight continues, with both fighters exchanging blows. However, it becomes increasingly apparent that Art is at a significant disadvantage. His muscles are underdeveloped, and his height falls short of what he was accustomed to in his previous life. Even though his body is tougher from assimilating Sylvia's dragon will, he still pales in comparison to a seasoned fighter whose body is enhanced with mana. Caspian decides to engage with greater seriousness after witnessing Art's extraordinary combat abilities. Caspian enchants his blade with wind magic and launches high-speed air bullets toward Art. He manages to narrowly dodge them, yet he quickly realizes that closing the distance is crucial if he wants any chance of victory. With each agile dodge, he gradually closes in. Finally, when he reaches within striking range, he infuses his blade with fire magic and launches an attack. Caspian employs his wind magic to block the assault that results in a clash of conflicting magical attributes being dispersed throughout the arena. Ordinarily, the outcome of this battle would have been apparent from the start. Caspian, a double A class adventurer capable of employing coveted long range spells, should have held the advantage. Yet, confronted with Art's extraordinary magical prowess, an undeniable sense of unease begins to creep upon him. Frustration consumes him as he finds himself pushed to the brink, prompting him to unleash an unrestrained, devastating magical attack against Art. Without hesitation, he follows it up with another swift wind bullet, denying Art a chance to regain his footing. Acting swiftly, Art employs his fire magic to propel himself into the air in an attempt to gain an advantageous position. However, he makes a critical error upon landing and unintentionally draws too close to Caspian. Seizing the opportunity, Caspian launches yet another wind bullet. Just as the match appears to reach its conclusion, Art stumbles backward, avoiding the wind bullet by sheer chance. Being cornered and desperate, he decides to reveal more of his hidden abilities. He uses fire magic on his feet to propel himself forward at remarkable speed toward his opponent. Caught off guard, Caspian fails to react to this sudden burst of velocity. Art successfully seizes Caspian's arm, seemingly tipping the scales in his favor. However, unwilling to accept defeat, he unleashes a powerful surge of wind magic in one last effort, sending Art flying backward. As Art faces his opponent head-on, he realizes that this is no longer a mere examination as Caspian is now fighting to preserve his honor as a double A-class adventurer. Even Jasmine grows concerned and radies her weapons, prepared to intervene if the match spirals further out of control. Art decides it is time to unleash his lightning magic to confront Caspian. There are two schools of lightning magic, external and internal. While it is normally taught that internal is not as powerful as external, as it is too hard for mages to learn for a relatively small increase in power. However, Art disagrees. With his enhanced speed and reflexes, he can dodge any attack Caspian throws at him. Just as Art is about to launch an attack with new enhanced speed, the match abruptly halts as Caspian suddenly refrains from using his mana. He sheaths his sword and apologizes to Art for getting carried away. He realizes that Art made a great effort to hide his true abilities right up to the end and assumes that the reason is that he wants to be placed at a lower rank. Hence, honoring Art's wish, he places him in B rank, the crowd is left stunned by the amazing match they just witnessed. Even Lucas and Elijah are left shocked by Art's amazing skills. Caspian leaves the arena in frustration for not being able to win against someone he assumed was weaker than him. The examiner makes the announcement that the exam is over, and all adventurers can go to the reception desk to get their adventurer's card. With that, everyone starts to leave the arena. Back in his office, Caspian still can't help but think about his match with Art. His chain of thought is interrupted as the two other examiners suddenly burst in demanding an explanation for everything that happened. After today's exam, they have three B-rank adventurers, which is more than the last four months combined. Not to mention that all of them are kids. 
On top of all that, Lucas has a light orange core at only 11 years old, which is damn near unhuman. He calms them down and explains that after the interracial tournament six months ago, the ban on elves and dwarves becoming adventurers under Sapin has been lifted. Today's exam included some of the representative examinees. Starting with Lucas Wikes, a half-elf residing in Sapin, his information remains classified and is inaccessible to the guild. Caspian surmises that Lucas might be an elf slave, considering the infamous reputation of House Wikes for employing unscrupulous methods in their pursuit of breeding exceptional mages. Despite his elven lineage, Lucas displays exceptional proficiency in fire magic. Awakening at an unusually early age of eight, even by elven standards, he was compelled to become an adventurer to enhance his abilities through real combat. Moving on to Elijah Knight, his origins remain shrouded in mystery, but Caspian assumes he was raised among the dwarves from an early age. As he is the representative of the Dark Kingdom, he gained placement in the B rank without undergoing an exam due to the endorsement of a reliable source. However, even Caspian ponders the extent of Elijah's abilities, harboring curiosity regarding his true potential. Regarding the masked augmenter, Caspian remains oblivious as he lacks any knowledge or understanding of their identity. The mention of note incites fear in one of the examiners, evoking memories of their encounter with Art earlier. Although Caspian knows Art does not hail from any noble lineage, he was intrigued by the person Jasmine Flamesworth chose to sponsor. Thus, the reason he conducted the examination personally, the Flamesworth House has gained renown for producing powerful fire attribute mages. He instructs the examiners to keep the information confidential. Caspian recalls his encounter with Art once more. He discerns that while Art's magic proves effective, it is his formidable sword that truly sets him apart as an adversary. With elves and dwarves now capable of becoming adventurers, he feels excited about this new era of adventuring. In the kingdom of Eleanor, Tessia reminisces about her time with Art. Occasionally using Rinya's crystal ball to check on his well-being, she still yearns for her friend's presence. To her delight, Virian informs her that she can attend the same school as Art if she desires. He reveals that her parents, the king and queen of Eleanor, have been negotiating with the humans to allow elves and dwarves to study at Xyrus Academy. Since Art will be attending the academy in three years, Tessie will be his senior by the time he enrolls. Her father encourages her to train diligently, as it marks the dawn of a new generation of mages. Back in the Adventurer's Guild, Art waits patiently to get his new Adventurer's card. He recalls his match with Caspian and how fun it was. He asks Jasmine if she is close to Caspian. She tells that her father has deep connections within the Adventurer's Guild and Caspian is one of them. Their conversation is interrupted by a call from the receptionist for note. After making his way to the reception desk, Art receives his adventurer's card. Finally, he has become an adventurer. He can now live a life as note, free from the ties that held him back as Arthur Lewin. However, he realizes that he has spent too much time learning this new world's magic system, and because of this, he has neglected his training in the very thing he was best at. In his past life, Art utilized his meager chi pool to refine the simplest techniques, and that is how he became so strong. However, those limitations don't exist in this world. He wonders if he should continue his pursuit of magic or if he should train his sword skill. He asks Jasmine whether they should take a quest or the bulletin board, but she tells him that with his skills, it would be a waste of time to do that. So, she suggests something different. The two of them decide to use the city's teleportation gate to travel to the Beast Glades to begin their new phase of training. It's a beautiful forest surrounded by huge mountains, as they reach the base of the majestic mountains, Art and Sylvie continue their trek in a well-explored region utilized by lower-ranked adventurers for training and questing. Suddenly, Sylvie catches sight of a mana beast and eagerly chases. Art decides not to pursue her, allowing her to revel in the pursuit. Confident in their telepathic connection, he knows he can still communicate with her and ensure her safety. Jasmine informs him that within the beast glades, where mana levels are notably denser, their telepathic link will extend much farther than usual. Empowered by this knowledge, the two adventurers press onward on their journey. Art can't help but feel a sense of pride and protectiveness towards Sylvie, akin to a parent witnessing their child venture off to school for the first time. With a heartfelt message urging Sylvie to remain safe, he focuses his attention on commencing his training alongside Jasmine. They reach their first campsite by sunset. Art feels completely exhausted from having to keep up with Jasmine, Throughout the journey, he was barely able to keep up with her despite using his mana rotation. 
At nighttime, while they are sitting around the campfire, he asks her why she became an adventurer. Judging from the change in her expression, he instantly realizes he has touched upon a sire spot. Nevertheless, she replies by telling him that she wanted to get away from her family. The Flamesworth House was a major contributor to the war against the elves. They have produced many powerful mages. Their lineage in the fire element is second to none. The Flamesworth House takes great pride in this as the fire element is considered to be the strongest. Naturally, when Jasmine was awakened earlier than all her siblings, her parents placed high expectations on her. However, when she showed an aptitude for the wind attribute instead of the fire attribute, her family regarded her as lesser. Art gets angry on her behalf and starts yelling about how no attribute is inherently better than the other. This makes Jasmine burst out laughing, seeing him rambling and losing his composure for the first time. She reassures him that she is fine with it. Whether it's Augmenter versus Conjurer or one element over the other, humans are always looking for a way to feel superior. It's just in their nature, and she has come to accept that. Even while laughing and smiling, this is the first time Art has seen her vulnerable. On the following day, Art eagerly commences his training session with Jasmine. As a preliminary step before embarking on any quests, they engage in a friendly sparing match. This allows Jasmine to assess Art's physical limitations and capabilities before venturing into dungeon runs. She advises him to restrain his mana usage, permitting him to solely employ it to dampen the impact of his strikes. Just as Art reaches for his sword, she interjects, halting him in his tracks. She reveals that she has been aware of his concealed second sword all along. As Art unveils the translucent blade, she finds herself momentarily taken aback. With the stage set, the spar commences, and Art swiftly charges toward her, aiming to launch an attack. Effortlessly, Jasmine evades his assault and endeavors to counterattack. He feels somewhat awkward without his magical abilities and barely manages to parry her strike with his sword. In this duel, Art's apprehensions are validated. He realizes that his relentless focus on mastering magic had caused him to neglect his swordsmanship, a skill in which he excelled prior to his arrival in this new world. His prowess in magic has become a crutch that he leans too heavily on. It had masked his shortcoming all this while but now he finally realizes his mistake. Without his magic, he has no choice but to give up or lose the match. Jasmine tells him that his physique is lacking and his movement is awkward however, he is able to make up for it with his good technique. Nevertheless, she reassures him that he will naturally get stronger once he reaches his teens. However, that's too late for Art. He makes a rough estimate that he must be around seven years ahead in mana manipulation, so he will solely focus on sword fighting to improve his skills. He makes the bold claim that all he needs is two years and he will master the art of swordsmanship. End of season one. Two years had elapsed since then. According to the rumors going around of a masked master swordsman who also uses magic, there have even been stories about him clearing a dungeon all by himself, without using any magic. Not even a B-ranked Augmenter can accomplish this feat, let alone an unknown adventurer without using magic. One adventurer named Termin refuses to believe the rumors. His partner even suggests that he must be getting help from Jasmine as he is traveling with her. Drunk and overconfident, he even boldly declares that he can beat this masked swordsman any day. There have been rumors that the masked swordsman was given a B-rank straight out of the rank exam and has now moved up to an A-rank. This would mean that the masked swordsman became A rank in just two years, another feat that seems impossible. The tavern door suddenly opens, and everyone is left stunned when they see the person who enters. It's none other than the famous masked adventurer himself. Believing himself to be stronger, Termin takes out his sword to challenge Art. Although his partner tries to stop him, he goes up to him and tries to intimidate him. Art tries to ignore him, but he uses his wind magic to attack him from behind. There is a big explosion of wind, but when the dust clears, Termin is surprised to see that Art dodged his attack without much effort. Frustrated by his failed attempt, he imbues his sword with wind magic and once again tries to attack. Art swiftly dodges all the attacks and with one clean slice, he cuts off all of the fingers of the adventurer. Everyone else can feel the intense pressure from Art, and no one dares attack him to rescue Termin. Art decides not to continue the fight. He goes to the reception desk to get what he originally came for, a sack of rations. When he leaves the tavern, he finds Jasmine waiting for him with their horses. She is surprised to see blood on Art's mask. He takes off his mask and reassures her that there was no permanent damage done. They ride their horses to their next destination. Art has continued to write to his parents daily. A lot has changed over the past two years. After diligently meditating every day, 
Lilia finally managed to awaken as a mage. Now she can attend Exiris Academy. She will be Art's senior by the time he joins. He has also managed to reach the light orange stage. Jasmine helps him every day with conditioning and teaches him everything she knows about wind magic. On the other hand, Art teaches her better blade techniques. There are only a few weeks left until he starts school at the Exiris Academy. He ends the letter with a promise to see them soon. Art entrusts the scroll with the horse, knowing that these well-trained creatures instinctively return to the stable master when left alone, ensuring their safety from potential monster encounters. Meanwhile, Sylvie dedicates herself to intensive training in the treacherous beast glades. Her growth is evident as she has gained the ability to transmit more intricate messages, Yet she remains resolute in her decision not to join Art and Jasmine just yet, expressing her desire to return once she feels adequately prepared. Although Art ponders the true meaning behind Sylvie's words, Jasmine offers reassurance, suggesting that Sylvie simply desires to enhance her strength before they embark on their academic journey together. As they reach the entrance of a foreboding dungeon, they rendezvous with another adventuring party. Art is taken aback to discover the presence of Lucas Wykes standing among their ranks. A confident adventurer steps forward and introduces himself to the pair as Reginald Bastion, an esteemed A-class augmenter whose expertise lies in earth magic. He proudly declares his current standing at the solid yellow stage of proficiency. Additionally, he introduces Lucas, although Art is already acquainted with him from their prior encounters. Having dedicated two years to their training, Lucas has impressively progressed to the dark yellow stage of his own magical journey. Among the adventuring party, they encounter Creole Masser, a formidable water attribute augmenter who assumes the role of their stalwart tank. Art's surprise grows as he recognizes yet another familiar face, Elijah Knight, who has progressed to the dark orange stage of his magical journey with his expertise in earth magic. Serving as the group's dedicated healer is Oliver Hembat, an A-class mage adept in mission magic. He possesses a dark yellow core. Completing the ensemble is Samantha Tempest, the sole female member an accomplished dark yellow conjurer who specializes in water magic. Samantha's fascination is palpable as she finally comes face to face with the renowned masked swordsman. Leading the party with an aura of authority is Brawl Landon, adorned in resplendent plate armor reminiscent of a knight. As an esteemed double A-class augmenter, he wields a light yellow core and boasts mastery in the art of fire magic. He tells the pair that he will be leading the party for the mission. Jasmine and Art also decide to introduce themselves to the group. Jasmine has now reached the double A class and her core is at the light yellow stage, same as Brawled. Art also introduces himself to the group. He tells them his specialty is fire magic. This surprises Samantha as according to the rumors, the masked swordsman doesn't have any elemental affinities. Art corrects her and tells her that he just hasn't been using magic because of personal reasons. Since both Art and Jasmine are still wearing their bags, Rald assumes that they don't have any dimension rings, so Elijah offers to store their belongings in his ring. As soon as he brings his hand close to their bags, they get sucked in like a vacuum. Art is a bit surprised to see Elijah carrying a dimension ring. This is because they are very expensive. The technology used for the rings was left behind by ancient mages who built the floating city of Cyrus. Even one with not a lot of storage space can go for thousands of gold. With the preparations complete, the party finally heads into the dungeon. The party follows Brawl's lead as they approach the first level of the dungeon. However, they are surprised to see that it's completely empty with not a single monster in sight. They continue walking towards the door to the second floor when suddenly they see a rock falling from the ceiling. They are left horrified when they look up to see the source. The ceiling is covered by bat-like monsters called bat runners. Brawl quickly orders everyone to get into formation. The party finds themselves surrounded. However, despite their numbers, bat runners are weak low-level monsters so the party is able to hold them off whenever they attack. Brawl orders everyone to conserve their mana for the deeper level. Lucas completely disregards this order and uses a high-level fire spell called Fire Cyclone. A huge fire vortex envelops the party and takes out all the bat runners in one hit. The leader gets angry with Lucas for disobeying his orders. However, he doesn't care and tells him that it doesn't matter since he killed all the monsters. The party starts heading towards the next level when Art notices something strange. The dungeon is known for its mysterious undead inhabitants. Living up to its name, the Bat Runners begin to reanimate. The adventurers who come in are left to fight endless hordes of undead monsters, and thus the dungeon was named the Dire Tomb. 
the party manages to get away by quickly running towards the door to the next level and sealing it behind them using earth magic. They reach the spot where Brawled found the hidden entrance the last time he came to this dungeon. To get to the next level, they must scale a wall. Elijah uses his earth magic to make handholds for everyone, making it much easier to climb. They reach the entrance to the next level. This is the furthest point Brawled got to before deciding to go back and return with a team. He speculates that the artifact responsible for reanimating the Bat Runners could be there. With that in mind, the party heads to the next level. As the group delves deeper into the dungeon, the temperature rises noticeably. Suddenly, Samantha is ambushed by a sharp spike, but Art swiftly intercepts and saves her by deflecting it with his sword. The revelation of traps in the dungeon surprises everyone, as Brawled recalls no traps during his previous visit. Upon examining the spike, Art realizes it was not a trap, but an attack from a mana beast. The group becomes more vigilant as they press onward toward the next level. Upon reaching the entrance, Brawled and Art sense that something is amiss, not just the scorching heat, but an overwhelming pressure indicative of a formidable monster. As they traverse the level, the ground trembles and a colossal worm-like creature emerges before the party. Acting swiftly, Creole employs water magic to create a protective barrier around the group. It becomes evident that this monstrous worm was not present during Brawl's initial exploration of the dungeon. However, it doesn't make sense for a new mana beast to suddenly appear in the dungeon like this. Their immediate concern, however, is to deal with the monster. The group prepares themselves for the monster's attack. They are surprised to see that the monster doesn't attack them and burrows into the ground again. Oliver starts to lose his patience and suggests moving forward to get the artifact since the monster is no longer here. Despite the order to get back in formation, Oliver starts walking to the level's exit. When the party starts to follow him, Art notices cracks being formed in the ground. He quickly yells at Lucas to cast his heatwave barrier and grabs Brawl to get him close to the rest of the group. Lucas instinctively follows Art's order and casts a barrier. However, the barrier doesn't reach Oliver as he is too far. Before Art could tell him to cast a barrier for himself, the ground erupts like a volcano, covering him in flames. Because of the barrier's protection, the rest of the party manages to stay unharmed. When the flames finally clear up, the group is left horrified to witness what is left of him. Oliver is left completely burned with the only remaining part of his body being his skeleton. His sense of terror grips the party as they witness the horrific spectacle before them. Despite the fear, Art remains composed and quickly seizes the opportunity. He retrieves the magic crystal from Oliver's wand and hands it to Samantha, urging her to replace her current crystal with the more potent one. With unanimous agreement, the party hastens its retreat as another eruption looms. They sprint towards the exit, but their path is abruptly blocked by the reappearance of the colossal worm. Reacting swiftly, Creole erects a protective barrier to shield everyone from the creature's onslaught. Following Brawl's command, Samantha and Elijah unleash their spells in an attempt to stun the monster. However, their magical assaults prove ineffective against its impervious body. Brawl then directs Jasmine and Reginald to join him in a coordinated attack against the creature. They unleash their immensely powerful techniques, Jasmine and Brawl engage the worm, striving to keep it occupied, while Reginald seizes the opportunity to deliver a crushing blow with his hammer. Watching the scene unfold, Lucas can't help but feel scared for the first time in his life. Art also joins in on the attack. He imbues his sword with fire magic and leaps up to get close to the monster's head. As soon as he is close enough, he uses a powerful slash to slice off the monster's fangs. He signals to Jasmine, and she uses this opportunity to land a powerful attack on the monster using her wind magic. It works and she is able to deal a lot of damage, forcing the worm to retreat. The party begins to relax thinking they have defeated the monster. However, soon after the ground begins rumbling again, Art realizes that the worm wasn't trying to kill them, instead it was trying to buy time for the next eruption to occur. Everyone acts quickly to form barriers around themselves and their teammates. However, Art notices that Lucas isn't acting and has dropped his weapon. Without his staff, he can't form the barrier. This also results in Samantha being left undefended as there is no one left to form a barrier around her. Brawl acts quickly to rush over toward her to protect her. Art too rushes over to Lucas to save him using his fire magic. The eruption occurs and everyone manages to survive despite all the problems. A wave of horror washes over the party as they behold Brawled. He lost his entire arm when he protected her from the eruption. In order to prevent Brawled's injury from worsening, the party swiftly tends to his wound. Reginald assists by holding him down, while Art employs his fire magic to cauterize the severed limb. 
Once the immediate treatment is complete, Samantha takes over using her water magic to continue caring for his injury, allowing the rest of the party to relax momentarily. Amidst the gravity of the situation, Creole attempts to uplift Art's spirits by offering him a sandwich, revealing it to be a recipe crafted by his fiancé. Grateful for the gesture, Art expresses his thanks and asks Creole to convey his appreciation to his fiancé for the delicious meal, brightening Creole's mood. However, their conversation is abruptly interrupted by a heated argument erupting between Lucas and Brawled. Lucas blames Brawled for being an ineffective leader, criticizing the loss of their healer. Brawled's anger flares, shouting back at him for carelessly dropping his weapon, resulting in him having to shield Samantha and suffering the loss of his arm. Forced to intervene, Art steps in and halts the escalating conflict. Lucas attempts to belittle Art, highlighting his lower status as an orange stage augmenter. Unfazed by the provocation, Art firmly asserts that he doesn't care about Lucas' stage, emphasizing that his current liability outweighs any perceived superiority. Unable to muster a response, Lucas seats with anger and departs. Art then turns his attention to Brawled, presenting him with the pivotal decision of whether he wants to continue or not as the injuries sustained by the rest of the party are less severe. Brawled resolves to press on, acknowledging that this dungeon raid may be his final one. Despite concern from Samantha, he reassures her of his capabilities as a double A-class adventurer, emphasizing that his combat prowess remains intact even with one arm. However, he suggests that Art should take the lead going forward, recognizing his composure and level-headedness during the previous encounters. Art accepts the responsibility and addresses the group, announcing an hour of rest before resuming their journey. Eventually, the party reaches the entrance to the next level where Brawl once again observes changes since his previous visit to the dungeon. They discover the entrance obstructed by an imposing wall. Despite Reginald's attempts to break it with his hammer, and even utilizing his earth magic to augment the strike, their efforts prove futile. Jasmine intervenes, employing her wind magic to generate additional force behind the hammer's swing. With combined strength, they succeed in demolishing the wall, revealing the entrance to the next level. A beautiful, lush forest awaits them on the next level. In the absence of supporting pillars, Art ponders how the forest hasn't collapsed, raising his concern. Although Creel suggests taking a break, Art's intuition warns him against it, prompting him to insist on maintaining a vigilant stance. While exploring the forest, Art remains plagued by an unsettling sensation. Suddenly, Jasmine and Creel both spot figures emerging from the mist, an enigmatic man in a suit and Creel's fiancée, Clara. Overwhelmed with emotion, Creole impulsively rushes toward the hallucination. Art tries to intervene, but Creole vanishes into the fog before he can reach him. Realizing that the fog is inducing illusions, Jasmine alerts the group, urging them to stay together and resist being deceived. Samantha swiftly creates a protective barrier, prepared for any potential attacks. In the midst of the chaos, she expresses curiosity about Clara. Reginald discloses that she was Creole's fiancé, though her presence here defies all logic since she perished in a previous dungeon expedition. The party's tensions escalate as Lucas vents his frustration, directing his anger towards Reginald and Brawled, questioning their abilities despite their experience as seasoned adventurers. Jasmine also seems shaken. When Art inquires, she tells him that she too saw someone in the fog. It was her father calling her with her arms spread out. She starts remembering the terrible memories of her childhood, but Art calms her down and assures her that everything will be okay. He asks her if she can clear the fog with her wind magic. Although she doesn't have a spell powerful enough to do so, she can however clear a path to find Creole. She uses a spell called Banshee's Howl to clear the fog in front of them. The party is left shocked to see that they are surrounded by vines. Art quickly signals Lucas to use his magic to burn them. He uses a powerful fire spell to try and burn the vines. However, it doesn't have much effect and the vines continue making their way towards them. Art orders Reginald to protect the conjurers while Jasmine and Brawled help him to break through the vines. The three of them use powerful attacks to cut through, however, the vines keep regenerating. Art notices that the vines have moisture in them and maybe that's why they aren't burning. He tests his theory out by slashing the vines with his sword without imbuing it with fire magic. It works and the vines are unable to grow back. He quickly tries to share this information with Brawled only to realize that he has gone berserk, relentlessly attacking without any thought about their effectiveness. Jasmine, on the other hand, has also figured out how to attack the vines and has been effectively dealing with damage. So Art decides to help Brawled out, 
Due to his ineffective strategy, the vines keep growing and he eventually gets caught. Art quickly rescues him by cutting the vines. He lectures him about his recklessness and tells him to fight smarter as the group still needs him. Eager to join the fight, Lucas drinks a potion to regenerate his mana. Then he fires off another spell. However, he also seems to have learned from his previous encounter. Instead of using the most powerful spell he knows, like he usually would, he uses a more flammable spell that spreads on contact. Elijah also uses his earth magic to collapse the group beneath the vines. With the ground sunk in and the liquid fire, it should be much more difficult for the vines to regenerate. Senatha also uses a spell called Aqua Siphon to suck out all the moisture from the vines, leaving them dry and brittle. Just as things start looking better for the group, the vines start absorbing the fog to revitalize themselves with moisture. As the fog clears up, everyone is left completely horrified at what they witnessed. The party finds themselves confronted by the Elderwood Guardian, a legendary and incredibly powerful monster rarely witnessed in real life, known only through the pages of books. The sheer magnitude of the S-Class Mana Beast shakes their confidence, and doubts begin to creep into their minds realizing the daunting challenge they face. Amidst the chaos, Reginald's keen eyes catch sight of something within the monster's core, a glimpse of Creole. As he approaches, discovering his dying friend, a surge of anger propels Reginald, and he readies his magic, preparing to confront the creature. Despite Art's attempts to intervene, it becomes apparent that time is running out as Reginald's body gradually transforms into a resilient stone armor. The Elderwood Guardian launches its assault, but Elijah swiftly employs his earth magic to shield Reginald from harm. In an unexpected twist, Jasmine grasps Art's hand, urging him to abandon the group and flee, invoking her promise to protect him as she once swore to his parents. While she tries to convince Art of this course of action, the relentless onslaught of the Guardian engulfs the rest of the party. Resolute, Art counters, asserting that he cannot abandon his comrades. Meanwhile, Reginald's stone armor enables him to engage the Guardian directly. Sensing the urgency, Art commands a retreat, with Elijah using his earth magic to safeguard their escape. Amidst the escalating peril, the group witnesses Reginald being ensnared by the Guardian. Acting swiftly, Art instructs Lucas to incinerate the encircling vines, facilitating Reginald's liberation. Yet before Art can finish his sentence, Lucas is engulfed by a powerful spell, and he launches a devastating attack at point-blank range, targeting Art himself. A few minutes ago before Lucas attacked Art, he had been struggling as he was getting blasted around by the Guardian. With the exit just in sight, he thought of ways he can escape. His growing pride becomes a hindrance, and he gets consumed by the notion that his survival must be prioritized, for he is from the mighty Wyke family, the very house that led to Sapin's resounding victory against Eleanor. He's willing to do anything, even betray his comrades. With this mindset, he uses a powerful spell on Art that sends him flying. Seeing this, Jasmine becomes horrified and runs to help him. However, Lucas continues his betrayal and uses a powerful spell on Jasmine, nearly killing her. Elijah is quick to react and saves her using his earth magic. So Lucas turns on him as well. Right now, the only thing on his mind is his survival. He tells Elijah that they should be honored as they will go down in history as heroes who delayed the beast long enough for him to escape. He fires off another spell to the roof. This causes the entire structure to start caving in. While being distracted by Lucas, Elijah gets attacked by the Guardian. He is unable to react in time and incurs heavy damage. Just as it seems like he's about to get killed, he is saved by Brawled. He is still mentally unstable, but he cares about his comrades. He attacks the Elderwood Guardian head-on with his fire magic. Despite successfully landing a powerful blow that slices the Guardian in half, his triumph is short-lived as the formidable creature swiftly regenerates. This leaves Brawl terrified as he realizes how hopeless it is to fight against this mighty opponent. On the other hand, a barely alive Art slowly regains consciousness. He looks around to see all of his comrades injured or unconscious from Lucas's attacks. He realizes that there is only one thing that can be done. However, he's unsure if he can survive the recoil. Suddenly, strange glowing marks start appearing all over his arm and his eyes turn purple. This is the phase two of his dragon awakening. During his training in Eleanor, he had breakthroughs that left Virian constantly baffled. His first improvement was unlocking the first phase of his beast will, the acquire phase. This allowed him to tap into Sylvia's innate skills. He could temporarily separate himself from time and space. However, this phase was limited in a lot of ways due to how much strain it put on his mana core and his physical body. The second breakthrough was something that even Art did not expect. What had taken Virian decades to achieve, 
he managed to achieve the same feat in just two and a half years, the integrate phase, Art's hair suddenly starts turning white. A purple aura starts surrounding his body as he delves deeper into the second phase. Elsewhere, even Sylvie notices the change in Art's body through their telepathic connection. She has grown a lot bigger due to her training for the past two years. Sensing something's wrong, she quickly rushes over to Art's location. However, Art assures her that he's fine and tells her to stay away for now. He instructs her to go back to Helsty's house if anything goes wrong. Now in the integrate phase, Art gets ready to attack the Elderwood Guardian. He forms a powerful white flame on his left hand and leaps toward the Guardian. He continues with his attacks, hoping that he can survive the backlash. It causes Elderwood Guardian great damage. The flames quickly destroy all vines and turn them into ice. Even though he can utilize all this ambient mana in this form, his body still can't handle the spell. He quickly starts to feel the backlash from using the integrate phase, but he shows no signs of wavering in his assault. The fight quickly intensifies as both of them start unleashing powerful attacks. Art uses his spell to continue freezing the vines. However, the backlash finally sets in as his hand becomes brittle and starts to crumble away. However, before the damage becomes even greater, he manages to freeze the Elderwood Guardian completely. With his other hand, he forms a massive attack. He combines the fire, water, and electricity element into one and punches the frozen Elderwood Guardian. This causes him to shatter and finally die. As the severe strain of extended integrate phase usage takes its toll, Art starts bleeding and quickly collapses. Meanwhile, in Exire City, Alice and Ray are taking care of Eleanor. The two parents are happily looking after their daughter when suddenly they're left horrified as Alice's rings start glowing, indicating that Art's life is in danger. With a flicker of consciousness, Art slowly opens his eyes. He finds himself greeted by the comforting presence of Elijah by his side. Elijah is relieved to see that Art has finally awakened. Using whatever few words he can muster, Art instructs him to take one of the healing constructs from his glove and break it. He follows Art's instructions and breaks one of the crystals. This causes the healing spell sealed within to get released and he gets healed along with his left hand. The first thing Art does is ask about Jasmine's whereabouts. Elijah points in her direction, showing him that she's also safe. However, her condition is really bad. She was hit a lot harder by Lucas's spell than him because her body wasn't fortified with mena. Although Elijah used a medical kit to treat her burns, she still has internal damage. Art asks him to take another crystal from his glove and use it on her. After doing so, Jasmine's injuries become a lot better. Her breathing starts looking better as well. Elijah assures Art that she's going to be fine after a few hours of rest. With that, he can finally breathe a sigh of relief. His current condition reminds him of when he was four years old, the time when he fell from the cliff. We see Sylvie continues making her way toward Art. Lucas, on the other hand, managed to escape from the dungeon. Art once again reassures Sylvie that he's out of danger now and instructs her to focus on her training. As Art rests, he begins to feel a sense of relief as his condition improves. Likewise, now that they are out of harm's way, Elijah also starts to unwind and relax. He now knows the true identity of the legendary masked swordsman and is surprised that he's someone that he tested together with and someone his age. With that, Art suddenly remembers that he has lost his mask. Elijah apologizes to him, telling him that it fell off during the fight and he couldn't get it. However, the most important to Art is his sword. Elijah assures him that his weapon is safe and within reach, understanding its significance to Art. Even though he didn't know if it was valuable or not, he decided to keep it just in case. Art extends heartfelt thanks to him for his remarkable actions in saving both him and Jasmine, as well as safeguarding his valued belongings. In reply, he humbly states that he couldn't fathom leaving them in a half-dead condition, for such a decision would have placed him on the same level as Lucas. Elijah becomes curious as to why Art decided to stay when Jasmine was trying to get him to leave. Art jokingly tells him that a king never betrays his people. However, the real reason is because of his promise to Sully to become a better person. He realizes that they're going to be stuck there for a while until Jasmine recovers, so he decides to use this time to get to know more about Elijah. Art initiates the conversation by extending a polite introduction to him, establishing a respectful and courteous tone from the start. He notices that the metal shelter around them doesn't seem to be naturally made. He asks Elijah if he is the one who made it. He tells him that he conjured it when the cavern caved in. This was to protect them from the debris. The Elderwood Guardian's body was the one supporting the entire cave, and when they defeated it, the entire structure started to collapse. Art realizes that Elijah is a deviant, 
as it is only possible to manipulate metal, not create or conjure it. However, that is only attainable by a dwarf. He agrees to share the details but with one condition. He asks Art to disclose what he did during his encounter with the Elderwood Guardian. He wants to know about Art's transformation. Art agrees to the proposition and Elijah starts telling him about his past. He was raised in the kingdom of Darv, but he's not sure where he originally came from. Elder Radias was the one who had taken care of him from the time when he was a child. However, the elder always avoided the question whenever he would ask about his parents. The only memories of his childhood would come as confusing and painful flashes. Elijah had lived a fairly normal life until he broke into the dark orange stage. After that, he experienced a weird surge of energy and blacked out. When he regained consciousness, he was surrounded by these strange black spikes of metal. After that, the elder told him that it was time for him to leave and explore the rest of the kingdom without even telling him why. Since then, he always had this strange feeling. Although he can't tell what it is, he's sure that it has something to do with his power and where he came from. Now it's Art's turn to fulfill his end of the deal. Just the first sentence leaves Elijah completely shocked. Art tells him that he's a quadra elemental augmenter with two deviances, ice and lightning. Elijah always thought he was the weird one, but now he's finally met a bigger freak than himself. However, he still wants to know about those markings and the color change that Art experienced during his fight with the Elderwood Guardian. Art reveals that he's a beast tamer and what Elijah saw back there was him unleashing his beast will. He is really surprised and asks how old Art is. When Art reveals that he's 11 years old, Elijah is further surprised to realize that he's one year older than him. However, he knows that this is not something he should be proud of. The two boys cannot help but randomly laugh at this silly fact. They have slowly started to bond over their shared trauma. Art suddenly experiences a bout of pain from his injuries. He has to use the last healing crystal from his glove to heal his injuries. As he's doing this, Jasmine also wakes up and quickly hugs him. She breaks down into tears and apologizes to Art for being unable to protect him. Seeing Art's injuries, she quickly tells Elijah to take out their bags from his dimension ring. She uses the emergency med kit in her bag to treat both of their injuries. Art is grateful to both of them, and with that, they start to make their way out of the dungeon. The trio exits the metal shelter. Before they leave, Art wants to search for any survivors. Elijah tells him that both Reginald and Brawl were consumed by the Elderwood Guardian before Art started fighting. So they are most likely dead. As for Samantha, he did manage to conjure a metal shelter around her before the structure caved in. However, she was in pretty bad shape, so he's unsure if she survived. It would be extremely difficult to find her in all this rubble. Even the Elderwood Guardian's beast core is probably lost. Elijah uses a spell called Earth's Pulse to try and search for her underground. He quickly finds her buried under the rubble with her heart still beating. Art is left surprised by Elijah's spell as it is normally only possible to search the surface of the ground using Earth's Pulse. Elijah quickly uses his proficiency in Earth magic to bring the metal shelter to the ground. He opens the metal charger to find Samantha still alive, although heavily injured and burning with fever but she is out of danger now. Jasmine picks up Samantha, and they continue on their way back. Art understands that it would be impossible to find the Guardian's beast core in this mess. This means that a priceless treasure would be lost. They suddenly hear rumbling from the ground. Elijah becomes fearful, but Art calms him down, telling him it's fine. A beast emerges from the ground, and it's none of it in Sildi. Even Art is surprised to see how much Sildi has grown in the past two years. Elijah is left stunned by the presence of a dragon as they were believed to be extinct. Hence, Art asks him to keep her existence a secret. Elijah recognizes him as someone who defies conventional expectations. He is an 11-year-old who is a quadra elemental with deviances in two elements and a dragon bond. Mounted on Sildi's back, the group embarks on their journey back to the exit. They don't even have to worry about fighting any monsters, because Sildi's presence is enough to scare them away. Sam the finally starts to regain consciousness, so they lay her down to make her feel comfortable. The group is shocked when she reveals that she has the Elderwood Guardian's beast core as well as Art's mask. She managed to save them before they were lost forever. Art takes his mask and tells the group that they will sell the beast core and divide the profit equally among themselves. Nonetheless, Jasmine swiftly informs him that she doesn't desire it. She believes Art is the one who deserves it since he's the one who took down the Elderwood Guardian. Elijah also feels the same way. Samantha also tells him that she's only alive because of him, so it's more than fair that he gets to keep the beast's core. Art thanks everyone and decides to keep it.
Seeing the extent of Samantha's injuries, Art tells Jasmine and Elijah to go to the guild hall to bring help while he and Sylvie stay with her to keep her safe. They agreed to Art's suggestion and quickly leave to get help. In the meantime, Art decides to use the scroll he got from the Twin Horns as his birthday gift two years ago to inform his parents that he is safe. Art's attention once again turns to Sylvie. She has gotten very big in the last two years by hunting mana beasts and eating their cores. Art asks her if she can still transform. Rather than telling him, she decides to show him by transforming herself into a much smaller figure similar to how she used to be. Art still feels pain from his injuries. He decides to use the mana from the beast's core to heal them. Now that everyone's safe and out of danger, his mind goes back to Lucas's betrayal. Because of what he did, Brawl died and so many of them got hurt. Art makes up his mind that no matter how long it takes, he's going to get his revenge on Lucas. The emergency team from the Adventurer's Guild arrives and helps Samantha and the rest of the group. Samantha gets the necessary medical help. While Brawl's family has to face the devastating loss of his death, Jasmine and Elijah deliver a thorough account of their experiences within the dungeon to Caspian, the guild master, leaving no detail unmentioned. The guild organizes a hearing for Lucas's betrayal. While they are waiting, Lucas arrives in the guild with his guard. He comes in with his usual arrogant self. Both Jasmine and Elijah gets angry ready to attack him. Yet Art stops them from doing so. Lucas feigns ignorance about their survival and subtly shifts the blame on them for sacrificing their teammate. Despite Caspian trying to de-escalate the situation, Lucas goes on and on and starts blaming the group for sacrificing Brawled. Suddenly, a sword comes flying in his direction, nearly missing his head. Lucas's equilibrium shatters at the sight of blood as the password meningitis is whispered, sending him into a state of uncontrollable panic and distress. The sword was thrown by none other than Hart. Upon realizing this, the guards quickly get into a protective stance to stop him. However, the intense aura coming off of Art is enough to send shivers down their spine. Their bodies start to feel heavy, and they begin trembling with fear. Following Lucas's order, the guards start moving to attack Art. However, they are no match for him as he easily defeats them using only one hand. Slowly but surely, Art continues defeating all the guards and moves toward Lucas. As he is about to attack him, he stops himself and retreats his sword. He apologizes to Caspian, telling him that his sword slipped, and he wanted it back. Lucas's fearful nature shows itself when faced with Art's terrifying power. As Lucas leaves the room, Art requests Jasmine and Elijah to leave as well because he wants to talk to Caspian alone. Caspian tells him that while he understands the situation, he shouldn't provoke Lucas. This suggestion angers Art. He tells Caspian that he's strong enough to erase Lucas from existence, and his identity will remain a secret. He gets right into Caspian's face to address the suggestion, which he thinks to be a threat towards him. The blood loss emanating from Art is enough to scare even a double-A adventure like him. He calms himself down and clarifies. He assures Art that what he said was with his best interest in mind. He reminds Art that even if he does manage to kill Lucas, the Wyke's house won't sit idly by even if his identity is a secret. They will go after the people close to him, like Jasmine and all the people she's affiliated with. This includes the Twin Horns, both current and former members. Until Art can hold enough power and authority to protect not only himself, but the people he cares about, Caspian advises against taking any extreme measures. He reveals some new information to Art that he didn't know before. Even if he does manage to take down the entire Wyke's house, he will still have to deal with Lucas's half-brother. Putting that aside, Art gets on to the main reason why he wanted to talk to him alone. Art knows his value in this world and realizes that Caspian would need him in the future. So he asks him for a favor. As long as it is within his power, Caspian is more than happy to accommodate. The hearing officially commences. Both Art and Lucas stand awaiting their sentences. First, it's Lucas's turn. For sabotaging and endangering his party members during the dungeon raid, he is stripped of his A-class ranking. Although instead of being devastated, he lets out a smirk, suggesting that this is exactly what he wanted. Furthermore, he also gets banned from re-enlisting as an adventurer. Art is not satisfied with this sentence, but this is something he expected. An offense that would normally land someone in prison only got Lucas a slap on the wrist because of his powerful background. As for Art, he is being sentenced because of his aggression towards Lucas. For his sentence, he's banned from entering Exiris City for the duration of Lucas's attendance at the Exiris Academy. A faint smirk also graces Art's face, 
a silent acknowledgement that the unfolding of the hearing aligns precisely with the carefully crafted plan he and Caspian had meticulously devised. He puts on an act and pretends to object to the punishment to make it more believable. This manages to fool Lucas, evident from his smirking at art. He is given permission to continue his career as an adventurer. However, he cannot be caught near Lucas. To Lucas's surprise, the sentencing ends right there. He wants to know the masked swordsman's real identity. He makes the case that he could just take off his mask and easily slip into the city. However, the guild assures him that his identity is being kept secret only to uphold the peace. Selected guild hall matches will keep tabs on Art's whereabouts. With that, the sentencing ends and both Lucas and Art are allowed to leave. Before leaving, Lucas tries to threaten Art, but that is not enough to scare him and he fires back with a threat of his own. After this, Art meets the head of the committee. The whole sentence was planned by Caspian and Art to alleviate Lucas's suspicions and to protect his identity. With a promise to remember this favor, Art leaves the Adventurer's Guild. As soon as he exits the building, he's greeted by Sylvie, Elijah, and Jasmine. Sylvie is very excited to see him. Together, the trio sought to head home. Before they part ways, Art suggests to Elijah that they should go to school together. However, this is not something he has ever thought about. Art remembers that the reason Elijah is trying so hard to climb up the ranks is to make a name for himself as an adventurer. If that's the case, Art suggests he go to Exiris Academy, but Elijah is still not sure. Despite all of his qualifications, you need money and connections to get into Exiris Academy. Nonetheless, Art assures him not to worry about that kind of stuff. Art requests Jasmine to take him home as he has something to take care of first. After thanking Art for everything he has done, Elijah leaves with Jasmine, the real reason Art wanted Jasmine and Elijah to leave was that he sensed Caspian's presence near him. He wanted the chance to talk to him alone. He thanks him for playing along with his little plan. Caspian tells him that he wanted to send him off with a parting gift. He throws him a bag of gold and tells him it's for extra precaution. Although Lucas has seen his real sword, Don's ballad, it won't be a problem as long as Art doesn't take it out. The real problem might be that Lucas has seen Sylvie. Yet, before he can even finish his sentence, that problem is also solved. Listening to his thoughts, Sylvie instantly transforms into a new form. Now, even Lucas cannot recognize her. With everything resolved, Art heads back to Exire City. He takes off his mask and makes a quick stop at a local shop. Using the money he got from Caspian, he buys a dimension ring. Despite knowing how expensive they are, he is still left shocked. He had to spend most of his gold on a dimension ring that can barely fit a sword in Beast's core. With this preparation for school, life is complete. Art sets on a carriage and starts heading to Helstie's mansion. On the way, he enjoys the beautiful scenery and wonders what it would be like to be a normal student. Art finally reaches his home at nightfall. He is greeted by his sister, Eleanor, who quickly hugs him and welcomes him back. Art realizes how speedily his sister has grown. With that comes the same concern that every loving brother has, that one day his sister might find someone, get married, and leave. However, he puts that fear aside for the moment to greet his parents. Their interaction goes like their usual greetings, Rhea holds his immaturity while Art playfully mocks his father's unruly beard. As always, the worried mother hugs his son and tells him that she's glad that he's back in one piece. Art hugs her back and apologizes for always making her worry. Vincent, Tabitha, and Elijah also show up. Vincent, also being his usual self, interrupts the family's moment. After the initial greetings are done and family gets together to talk, Art realizes that Jasmine is nowhere to be seen. Elijah informs him that she already left to do a mission with the Twin Horns and had left a letter for him. From the goofy way the letter was written, Art could tell that it was written by Jasmine. Apart from her, there is one more face that's missing. Before Art could even ask, Vincent excitedly tells him that Lilia is currently at Exiris Academy. Tabitha thanks Art for his help in her awakening and tells him that the Helstie family will forever be in this debt. Vincent reaffirms it and tells him that it has been generations since a mage came out from the Helstie house. He tells him that he is not sure about the debt, but he does have a few favors in mind. That favor involves getting Elijah into the Exiris Academy. But before Art could tell him that, Ray suddenly gets up and asks about his dungeon raid. Art and Elijah explain the entire story of the Elderwood Guardian. The family is shocked that Art actually encountered an Elderwood Guardian, a mana beast that parents use to scare their kids into behaving. On the topic of monsters and magic, Art asks Ray what stage he is at. He tells him that he has been stuck at the bottleneck of the dark orange stage. No matter how hard he tries, he just can't seem to break through. 
Art hands him the Elderwood Guardian's Beast Core. Using the mana from the Beast Core, he should be able to break through. Ray initially refuses to accept it, telling Art that this is something he risked his life for, and so he cannot take it. However, Art taunts him by telling him that he will need it if he wants to catch up to him. Ray gets frustrated and excited as Art reveals that he has reached the light orange stage, which is two stages ahead of him. After thinking about it for a while, Ray accepts the gift and promises to leave him behind the next time they duel. For the time being, Elijah is living in Helstie's mansion along with Art. They have to share a room, resulting in them having a few awkward moments from time to time. While looking at his mask, Art realizes how much has happened in the past two years. He has met so many people and made so many new friends. Even Sylvie has grown up and has become much stronger than she was. Art tells Elijah that he has talked to Vincent about sponsoring him so he can attend Exiris Academy. He gets excited and asks Art about Vincent's response. However, instead of replying, Art decides to tease him and leaves. Later that night, while trying to sleep, Elijah cannot stop thinking about going to Exiris Academy. He wonders what kind of things he'll learn there. Art tells him that it will probably be boring because their skill set is already way above the level of a normal first-year student. However, Elijah is still excited about the possibility of meeting a lot of people from diverse backgrounds and learning from them. Even Art acknowledges that learning about lightning and ice attribute magic might be useful. Lightning magic still takes too much mana for him to use, and despite using his beast's will, it's hard for him to control ice magic. Elijah asks him what he's going to do about Lucas. Art tells him that since Lucas has no idea who he is, he's going to keep training until he's sure that he can take on his entire family. While Elijah wonders if he'll be able to find a girlfriend at Exiris Academy, Art assures him that he will be fine and tells him to go to sleep. The next morning after getting up, Art runs into Vincent in the hallway. During their meeting today, he was curious about talking with an inventor, so Vincent decided to go ahead and contact one for him. His name is Gideon. He is not only a famous researcher, but also one of the most accomplished inventors and artificers in Sapin. He arrives in Exiris City in three days, so Vincent tells Art that they can meet up with him before joining everyone else in downtown Exiris. On the same day, the royal families of Sapin, Eleanor, and Darv will make an important announcement in Ediston, which will be broadcasted in the downtown square. Art thanks him for setting up the meeting and for the explanation. Vincent is still curious about why he wants to meet Gideon. Art replies vaguely by telling him that he wants to discuss something. The real reason is that he believes it's finally time to use the knowledge from his past life. Their conversation is interrupted by Ray. He reminds Vincent that he had a meeting with someone this morning. With that, he takes off running, leaving the father-son pair behind. Art asks Ray about his training, and he replies by telling him that he has officially broken into the solid orange stage. This was made possible because of the beast core that Art gave him. However, for some reason, it didn't crumble away even after he finished absorbing all the mana from the beast core. Yet instead of thinking about it too much, Ray decides to give the core back to Art to let him examine it. Ray once again thanks him for giving him the beast core and leaves to continue his training. Art finds it strange and begins wondering why the beast's core didn't crumble. When he inspects the core using his mana, he is shocked by what he discovers. The core contains a beast will inside it. Beast wills are a coveted force that grants users very powerful magic, obtainable only when a powerful mana beast passes on its will, or taken from within a beast core. Art wonders what would happen if he were to integrate with two beasts. With that in mind, he begins his experiment to try and integrate the Elderwood Guardian's beast will with his body. As he begins to concentrate, his dragon's will begins to overpower the Elderwood Guardian. Eventually, it tries to consume the Elderwood Guardian completely. Nonetheless, Art manages to stop the integration process before the Guardian gets completely destroyed. Now he knows one thing for sure, he cannot have two beast wills yet he still wonders why his father couldn't absorb the beast's will. He suddenly remembered something that Virian told him during training. The mana beast's element and the mage's elemental attribute must be compatible for them to integrate. This is something that Virian told him, but he forgot. Without any doubt, Art has determined that the ideal candidate to receive this extraordinary beast core is none other than Tessia. The next few days flew by quickly. While Art trains every day to get stronger, he also makes sure to have enough time to hang out with his family, spending the days as any normal boy would. The day of the announcement by the Three Kingdoms has finally come. As always, Ellie comes to wake him up in the morning. When he refuses to wake up, she even delivers a big grand slam. Following his painful awakening, 
Art gets ready to meet Gideon. Art, Elijah, and Vincent arrive in the town square. Elijah decides to head off on his own to do a little shopping with the money he saved up from their dungeon raid. Art tells Sylvie to go with Elijah while he visits Gideon. Art and Vincent both head to Gideon's house. They are greeted by a creepy man who is Gideon's servant. He initially tries to get them to go away, but when he realizes that it's Vincent, he politely welcomes them in. Upon entering the house, Art is greeted by a horrible stench. It soon becomes apparent that it's because of the horrible mess the house is in. Suddenly, Gideon emerges from under a pile of clothes. His appearance resembles that of a ghost or perhaps a zombie. He is not particularly fond of meeting new people. This is because he is fed up with the constant messages he has been getting from royal families in the past year. They all want him to come up with a way to travel long distances across the ocean. Art becomes intrigued to hear this. Gideon asks Vincent who is this little boy he has brought with him. Art decides to take the initiative and introduce himself. Gideon still wonders why Vincent has brought him over. But this question is something Vincent himself wants to know the answer to. Art came here with something in mind. But after hearing that Gideon wants to find a way to travel across the ocean, he decides to do something different. He grabs a blue piece of paper and starts drawing something. Initially, Gideon thinks of it as nothing more than an overconfident kid with some silly idea. However, when he looks at what Art has come up with, he is left shocked. It's a design for a modern engine powered by steam rather than mana. Gideon is left completely amazed, though he notices that some parts of the design don't add up. He quickly realizes that something is missing. Art interrupts his chain of thought and tells him that he intentionally left out some key details. He tells Gideon that he will only reveal the rest of the details once the negotiations are over. Gideon wrongfully assumes that Art wants money in return, so he orders his servant to bring out one of his many priceless artifacts. The servant brings an ironized diamond capable of storing five times its size and mana. Yet it doesn't interest Art. Gideon is not the one to give up so easily so he orders his servant to bring out all his most priceless artifacts. He offers Art one treasure after another, but he refuses every one of them. Despite trying his hardest, he fails to interest Art with any of his artifacts. Left with no other choice, he orders his servant to bring out his most valuable possession. Even the servant is left surprised when he orders him to do so. It's a set of two beautiful-looking pendants. He had a world-class designer work on their aesthetics because they were being prepared for the royal family. With one look, Art realizes what he's holding. These pendants were made from a phoenix worm. They are a race of S-class mana beasts, about as rare as dragons themselves. They are known for their unique ability to preserve their life. Gideon managed to store this ability in the pendants. Just like a phoenix worm is able to protect itself from danger, the user will be protected using a protective shell that will be conjured around the wearer. If the protective shell were to break, the user will be automatically transferred to a safe location away from danger. Art asks how many times one can use these effects. Although it's hard to tell, Gideon hypothesizes that they can be used two more times. Even though these were meant for the royal family, that's not important to him. What he's more curious about is how Art managed to come up with this design and why he's revealing it right now. To everyone's surprise, Art reveals that he's just trying to get a good birthday gift for his little sister. The first thought that comes to both Vincent and Gideon's minds is that he must be lying. Surely, no one would reveal such important knowledge for such a trivial reason. But Art makes it clear that he does not plan on revealing the rest of the details until Gideon tells him how he's going to use it. But this does not mean that Art is willing to let go of the pendants. Gideon gets annoyed, but Vincent assures him that Art is a man of his word. Desperate to know the rest of the details about the steam engine, Gideon agrees to the proposition. He reveals that last year they found evidence suggesting that there is another continent beyond the Cathan. Vincent had already heard rumors about this, but he didn't know if they were true. An employee of the Royal Academy let it slip and made him promise not to tell anyone. Gideon's confirmation made it all too real for Vincent as well. Anyway, Art still wonders how they can be sure that there is another continent. Gideon replies by telling him that a few years ago, they found an artifact that had never been seen in Decathan. It was attached to a bird-like mana beast. This mana beast had the ability to camouflage itself completely against its surroundings. This instantly raises a question in Vincent's mind. If the mana beast had the ability to fly as well as camouflage itself, then how were they able to capture it? The answer is simple. By sheer dumb luck, an amateur hunter missed his shot while trying to catch squirrels and accidentally shot down the bird. The artifact that the bird was carrying was so complex that it took years to figure it out. 
Only last year was Gideon able to figure out how it worked, and it finally confirmed everything. Art asks another question. What did the artifact do? Gideon tells him that only the royal family has the necessary clearance for this information. Art once again reminds him that if he wants the designs for the blueprint, he will have to continue telling him everything he knows. Gideon reluctantly reveals the information. The artifact can record and store moving images, but Art is still not convinced that this is evidence for a new continent. He thinks that it is possible that the artifact was made by some unknown artificer in the Cathan. Vincent tells Art that Gideon is not just simply an accomplished inventor, he is the greatest artificer in the history of Decathan. Gideon also confirms that if Art were to present any artificer from Decathan before him, they would immediately bow down before him. Art finally realizes that the technology behind the artifact was so complex that even the best artificer in Decathan was unable to figure it out. Hence, the royal family assumed that the artifact must not be from Decathan. Gideon tells him that the artifact also had detailed images of all three kingdoms. Art nonchalantly takes this information in without acting surprised. Gideon gets annoyed and tells him that they are talking about a continent filled with not only highly advanced artifacts, but also even stronger mages. This is the reason Gideon wants to build a steam engine ship so they can sail the ocean and find this new continent. As per their agreement, Art gives him the rest of the details. After the meeting, they head out to the town square for the announcement. On their way there, they are reunited with Elijah. He tells the group that he heard from Elder Radias that the three kingdoms have been in talks of unifying. Art wonders if this is because of the discovery of the new continent. As they continue making their way to the town square, the group comes across a bunch of nobles picking on a student from Darv. They are beating him up because of his dwarven lineage. Unable to just stand by and watch, Elijah quickly jumps in to save the student. This only serves to further increase the bully's anger. When Elijah tries to stand up to him and the bully slaps him, knocking away his glasses, this angers Vincent and he threatens to follow the guards, but he is stopped by Art. Although Elijah could easily take them down using magic, he realizes that doing so might get Art and Vincent into trouble, so he tells himself to remain calm and not lose control. The bullies recognize the symbol on his shirt. It's the symbol of the kingdom of Darv. Seeing this, the bullies get even more aggressive. They grab Elijah by the hair. Just as the bully is about to hit him with the metal pipe in his hand, he hears a sound. It's none other than Art who has brought a weapon of his own. Meanwhile, Prince Curtis and Princess Catherine are also going to the announcement. They are forced to use a single small carriage for discretion. This is not to the satisfaction of Prince. He would rather be as classy as possible. He went telling everyone that he planned on riding on top of his bond grotter. His bond is the same world lion he got from the auction at Helsey's auction house a few years ago. His bond has grown up to be the size of a carriage, yet he is still not trained properly. This comes as a concern to their bodyguard. But Prince assures everyone that he's getting a lot better. While going to the announcement, Princess Cathone notices Art in the street. On the other hand, Art is furious with the bullies. Vincent becomes really concerned as he has never seen this look on Art before. He is concerned that Art might actually end up killing them and tries to stop him. He tells him that they should prioritize Elijah's safety instead of anything else. However, due to a misinterpretation, the bully mistakenly perceives Vincent's actions as an attempt to save Art. There is a terrifying look on his face, he tells Vincent to step aside, which is enough to send shivers down his spine. Realizing it's too late, he politely steps aside. Underestimating Art's strength, one of the bullies confidently steps forward, telling everyone that he will handle it. The bully steps forward to hit hard with his metal pipe, but before he can even approach Art, he already gets a hit and is knocked down. The bullies still don't realize how strong Art really is. Another one of them steps forward, thinking he can bring Art down with his special technique. It's the technique passed down through generations within his family, and it's called Thousand Step Strike. In a futile display, the bully aimlessly circles around Art before finally launching an attack. As expected, Art is easily able to dodge this attack, and he knocks him down as well. In doing so, Art's twig breaks so he decides to finish the rest of the fight using his bare hands. The main culprit, Jamiel, is also very confident in his abilities, like the bullies before him. He throws away his metal pipe, determined to finish his fight with a single punch, and show the peasant his place in the world. Before he can even strike, he feels the terrifying presence emanating from Art. This is something that he has not even felt from his own father, who is the head of House Trident. Nevertheless, he leaps forward to attack Art, but he is knocked down instead. 
Even though he's barely conscious, his anger gets the best of him. He decides to use his water magic to attack, which is blocked by a wall of ice, and the mage is none other than Princess Cathon herself. When they first met at the auction house, Princess regarded Art as merely another boy, similar to her own immature older brother and his companions. Despite this, for some reason, she just couldn't take her eyes off of him. And this is how she found out that Art wasn't like the immature boys that she had grown to dislike. In the present, Prince Curtis arrives on the scene and demands an explanation for what's going on. All the bullies quickly bow down to him and tell the prince that they were minding their own business when the barbaric peasant suddenly started beating them up for no reason. The princess quickly figures out that it's a lie. Their story does not explain the injuries of the dwarf boy, despite the prince failing to realize this and demands an explanation from Art. He is still overcome with anger and dismisses the prince's words, calling them a joke. This angers their guard, and he goes to confront Art. He too quickly comes to realize that Art is no ordinary boy. Before the situation get out of hand, Vincent quickly intervenes. He apologizes on the Art's behalf and explains to the prince that the boys are lying. He explains the entire situation from earlier about how the boys were beating up the poor dwarf. Prince finally realizes the truth of the situation and demands to know the boy's name. The boy introduces himself as Jamiel, the firstborn of House Trident. They are a major donor to the royal family as well as the Exiris Academy. Despite knowing who's guilty, the prince decides to dismiss the situation to avoid any complications. This only feeds into Jamiel's ego as he knows that even the royal family cannot touch him because of all the gold that his father gives to the kingdom. As always, Art is not one to back down. He uses a two-way communication scroll to call Cynthia Goodsky. Everyone is left surprised by the sudden change in tone as soon as she hears Art's voice. He straight up tells Cynthia that he wants Jamiel Trident to be expelled along with his friends for racial bullying and the use of lethal magic in the city. Cynthia doesn't hesitate to do as Art asks of her and tells the bullies that they have been expelled. Now that the situation has been resolved, Prince Curtis apologizes to Art for being swayed so easily by Jamiel's words. Art also apologizes for his rudeness. With that, both Princess Cathalyn and Prince Curtis head back to their carriage to head to the announcement. Because of this event, Princess finds herself completely captivated by Art. Unable to hold herself back, she invites him for tea. Art also finds himself mesmerized by her beauty and agrees to meet her at school. At last, the group arrives at the town square. They reunite with the rest of the family. There are thousands of people here, and they're about to find out that there is another continent out there. Art wonders how they will react to the news, but what's really bothering him is the fact that the other continent has been spying on Decathan. He realizes that the mana beast with the ability to camouflage and use it for recording artifacts cannot just be a coincidence. Despite this, they would only be doing so if they feared the people of Decathan or if they had malicious intent. Art wonders if he made the right choice by expediting Decathan's ability to reach this new continent. Perhaps it could be for the best. If they are hostile, then this allows Decathan to launch a preemptive attack. Alice notices that Art seems more distracted than usual. She becomes worried about him and asks him if everything is all right. She tells him that although she will always worry about him, she will never stop him from doing what he wants. More than anything, Art wishes that he could promise her that she has nothing to worry about. Still, he does not want to lie to her like that. So instead, he replies to her with a heartfelt thank you. As the ceremony begins, two mages walk up to the front and launch four magical crystals into the air. These crystal balls start displaying a projection of all the kings, the ceremony is commenced by the King of Sapin, Blaine Glader. He addresses the audience not as the King of Sapin, but as the King of Humanity and the representative of the continent of Decathan. The crowd quickly gets on their knees and bows down to the King. The King acknowledges their relationship with other species. For a long time there has been an animosity between the humans and the elves and the dwarves have only been business partners. The King tells everyone that this is not how they wish to continue their relationship. In these past few years, there have been efforts to reunite the races. Two years ago, they all agreed to allow members of all three races to become adventurers. Last year marked another milestone. The Exiris Academy, the best magical school on the continent, allowed students from the Kingdom of Eleanor and the Kingdom of Darv. The king urges the crowd to put aside their animosity and work together for a brighter future. With the opening speech done, the King of the Elves steps forward to address the crowd. He makes the big announcement, which is also the main topic of today's ceremony. He announces to everyone that they have found evidence of another continent. 
This sends everyone into a state of shock. Whispers start echoing throughout the crowd. Everyone has their questions. Are they enemies or are they friends? Slowly the surprise among the crowd started turning into panic. The king calms the crowd and continues his speech. He tells the crowd that they don't know much yet. Although they do know that there's another continent out there full of mysteries, adventures, and possible dangers. There is also evidence that they have tried to make contact with Decathan. Before the king could continue talking, he is interrupted by the king of the dwarves. He urges the crowd to stand together in this time of uncertainty and do what's best for the people and the continent. Although their appearance may be different and their cultures may sometimes clash, the king reminds everyone that they were all born on the same continent. He tells everyone that he's proud of this fact and hopes that future generations will feel the same way. This resonates with the crowd and they all give him a big round of applause. The process of bringing these races together will take time and effort, but today they will be appointing six individuals. These six individuals have been selected by the royal families and are believed to be the most courageous, tactful, intelligent, and powerful individuals in their respective nations. They represent the three races on a continental scale. Their primary goal is to defend and maintain the well-being of Decathan. From henceforth, they will be known as the Six Lances. They will each be given a special ring. One by one, each of the members step forward, and they are given rings by their respective kings and queens. The first one is Elie Triskin, followed by Vere Ore, Alfred Warrand, Aya Griffin, Mecca Earthborn, and finally Baron Wykes. Both Elijah and Art are shocked to hear the last name. The King of Sapin ends the announcement by urging all the aspiring mages to strive to become one of the six lances in the future. Art finally met his enemy face to face. The day of the announcement had been a cold reality check for Art. Because of Lucas's insubordination and betrayal, most of their party ended up dying. He used his family's power and connection to walk free from all his atrocities. Art had been warned by everyone that seeking revenge against Lucas would be suicide. This is because he has the backing of his older brother who is not only a powerful mage, but one of the six members of the Lances as well. Yet Art decides to put that aside for now because he has more important matters to attend to, his sister's birthday party. He gets ready and wears a fancy suit for the party and tells Sylvie to stay in his room for the night. This is because Vincent told him that there might be some guests attending Ellie's party as a pretense to watch him, so he does not want to take any chances and risk exposing himself. Although he does promise Sylvie to bring her back a lot of food as a way to cheer her up. As the party begins, the guests start arriving. It doesn't take long for Art to impress everyone with his charm. It's a much different story for Elijah, though. He tries to impress the girls, but instead he drives them away because of his lack of elegance. The birthday girl finally arrives. She's blindfolded by Alice as she walks down the steps. As soon as she opens her eyes, she is surprised to see the amazing party. The party continues and everyone has an amazing time. The party is stopped as Ray gets up on stage to make an announcement. He thanks everyone for coming and tells them that he's blessed to have such an amazing daughter and son in his life. Much to the embarrassment of Ellie. But what comes next leads her horrified. Her father announces that his son and daughter will partake in the first dance. The horror is that this was never planned, so Ellie and Art never practiced. Surely they would make a fool of themselves if they were to do as Ray suggested. This even incurs Alice's wrath. Though Art is not about to let this ruin the party. He boldly takes Ellie's hand and makes his way to the dance floor. What happens next leaves both Alice and Ellie surprised. Art dances most elegantly as if he's a professional dancer. He even launches Ellie into the air using his air magic and slowly brings her down while making sure to make her look as beautiful as possible. The crowd is left amazed and they start applauding. Even Gideon is impressed by their performance. He tells Art that he would like to have a word with him. Art doesn't want to be bothered on this special occasion just to discuss some ideas, but Gideon tells him that he just wanted to let him know that the council has approved the designs that he got from him, and the construction is underway. The council consists of all the kings and queens from the three kingdoms. Art congratulates him and tells him that he must have been rewarded handsomely. In fact, money, fame, and power are not something that Gideon is interested in. Before he can continue, they are interrupted by a bunch of fans. While Gideon is distracted, Art seizes his chance to get away. The guests have begun leaving. He is met with an unexpected guest. It's Lilia. She apologizes to Art for not greeting him sooner. He tells her that it's fine and they spend time together chatting about their lives. Art realizes that Lilia has become quite popular with the boys. She gets embarrassed and tells him that she doesn't even have a boyfriend. 
This may be because she has developed a crush on Art. Their conversation is interrupted by Gideon. He politely asks Lilia if he can borrow Art for a moment. After saying goodbye to Art, she leaves him by themselves. Gideon, realizing Lilia's feelings, tells Art that she has a crush on him. Still to his surprise, Art tells him that he already knows that. He goes on to explain that her feelings towards him are not love, but more akin to gratitude. This is because he changed her life in a major way by helping her in her awakening. He tells Gideon that although she doesn't know it yet, in the future she will be able to distinguish. Putting that aside, Gideon gets back to the conversation they were having before they were interrupted. He doesn't care about money, fame, and power, but instead he wants something that even the consul cannot offer him, Art's knowledge. Art tells him that he is already having second thoughts about giving him the blueprints for this steam engine. He does not want to change the world any more than he already has. He believes that the continent is doing just fine without any more of his ideas. Even so, Gideon just hears what he wants to hear and realizes that Art has more ideas for world-changing inventions. Art makes it clear that he does not want to indulge in Gideon's selfish curiosities. So Gideon offers him a different deal. He tells Art that he does not want any world-changing inventions, but maybe he can let him pick his brain from time to time. In return, he will become Art's personal benefactor for any invention or good he needs. After thinking about it for a minute, Art agrees to the proposition. Back home, Ellie has started unpacking her gifts. He arrives just as Ellie is unbagging Tessia's gift. It's a beautiful ribbon with an elvish design. Next, it's time for Art's gift. He takes out the two pendants that he got from Gideon and presents them to Ellie and Alice. Ellie is taken aback by the beautiful necklace. Art once again wishes her happy birthday while putting the necklace on her. Four months have passed since Ellie's birthday. Gideon has brought Art over to the construction facility. No one is allowed inside this facility other than their employees and the council members. For the past few months, Art has been getting constant calls from Gideon for every little step of the project. Art's birthday passed not too long ago, but instead of having an extravagant party like Ellie, he decided to have a small party with just his family. Gideon decides to give him a late birthday present. It's a bracelet that Art requested Gideon to make for him. It will allow him to hide two of his elemental attributes. Gideon asks Art and why he wouldn't want a bracelet that would hide two elemental attributes instead of one. He jokingly suggests he is a quadra elemental and is left completely shocked when Art confirms that he actually is a quadra elemental mage. Getting back to the topic of the ship, Art is really impressed by how fast the ship is getting built. Gideon boldly declares that the Decathius will set sail on the day Art joins the Osiris Academy. On his way back home, Art can't stop thinking about how fast the ship is being built. He tells himself that if the new continent really is hostile that he cannot afford to slack off on his training. He plans to use this new artifact that he got to work on his wind and earth magic and bring them to the same level as his fire and water magic. While lost in thought, he bumps into a man. Even though Art apologizes instantly, the man is angry and threatens to discipline him. He boldly declares that he is a professor at the Exarius Academy and it is his job to discipline brats like him. He puts his hand on Art's head and tries to force him down to kneel, but he realizes how strong Art is when he can't even get him to budge. Art informs him that he's willing to let this slide because of his intoxication, but he better gets his hand off of him. The man cannot help but feel scared and he instinctively backs off. Although he still tells Art that if he's a student at the academy, then he better watch out. But instead, Art tells him that he looks forward to it while throwing the pendant toward him. The man realizes that Art managed to get his pendant off of him without him even realizing, indicating the clear difference in their strength. Art finally arrives home. He is greeted by Eleanor and Sylvie. She tells him that a package has arrived for him and Elijah from the Osiris Academy. It's their uniforms. Art can't help but think about his journey to this point. From an orphan to a king, to a baby, then an adventurer. And now, finally, he has become a student. As Art begins this new chapter in his life, he wonders how much more this world will teach him. The much-awaited day has arrived, as Art finally joins the Exiris Academy. Elijah comes to wake him up, but doesn't realize that Sildi is there as well. He makes a grave mistake, unintentionally disturbing Sildi's peaceful slumber. In her rage, she targets the only person around which happens to be Elijah. Art wakes up and calms her down, but not before she scratches up Elijah's face. Art quickly gets ready for their first day and puts on his uniform. There are two types of students at Exiris Academy, battle mages and scholar mages. 
Art will be attending the school as the Scholar Mage, while Elijah will be attending as a Battle Mage. As the name suggests, Scholar Mages learn about magic theories instead of practicing how to use magic in real combat. This comes as a surprise to Elijah, and he tells Art that he should have taken electives instead of centering his education on theories. However, fighting kids his age doesn't really interest Art. Although Scholar Mages get looked down upon at the school, that doesn't bother him. Rather than being concerned about Art, Elijah is more worried about the students who will get sent to the medical ward because they look down upon Art, but he shrugs off his worries and promises to be on his best behavior. The two boys come down to have breakfast with the rest of the family. Elijah gets his face healed off the scratch marks, while Alice and Ray argue about who did a better job of raising their son. So all in all, a pretty typical family breakfast. After breakfast, they head out to get on the carriage to go to school. Art says goodbye to Alice while promising to visit as often as he can. He reminds Ellie and Alice to keep the pendants on them at all times. He also tells Ray not to burn down the house while practicing. After a short ride on the carriage, they arrived at Xyrus Academy. It's a beautiful, luxurious building, no different from a palace. Art witnesses many students arriving on their bonds. Perhaps he could do the same with Sylvie, but that would be a shock to everyone, to say the least. The students are instructed to form a single file line in front of the white building. This is for the entrance ceremony, which is mandatory for all students. All the students walk in a single line and register themselves at the front desk. This is done by using a magical crystal ball. Art registers himself as a scholar mage candidate with an affinity for earth and wind magic. For some reason, the lady at the front desk is left shocked after hearing Art's magical affinities. This comes as a surprise to him, as he wonders why it is so shocking. She quickly apologizes to him and tells him to go on ahead. Art arrives at the huge auditorium for the entrance ceremony. Despite this fact, it's completely full. Not long after Elijah and Art find their seats, the ceremony begins. Cynthia Goodsky uses her wind magic to suddenly appear out of nowhere. Next, she proceeds to use her sound magic throughout the auditorium. As usual, the use of magic quickly catches Art's interest. Cynthia tells everyone that she doesn't like to speak up, especially in her old age, so she likes to use this little trick. She begins the ceremony by welcoming all the students to their humble academy. She proudly announces that this year they have had the most elf and dwarf students since the founding of the academy. Instead of giving a long and boring speech, she decides to bring out the student council. Since they are the very students that will be leading and giving a voice to all the new students, one by one, all the members of the student council come out on the stage. This includes Lilia, and the last person to step out is the student council president herself, who is none other than Tessia Erlith. She begins her speech with a welcome note for all the new students. Although she is a first-year student, like all of them, she has had the opportunity of being in the academy a year longer. She decides to address the discrimination that scholar mages face in the academy. If mere differences in uniform can divide them, then she worries about where the differences in race will lead them. She tells everyone to cast aside their prejudice that breeds hostility among races. Just like the royal families have come together to form the council, she tells everyone that they should do the same for the future of the continent. She ends her speech with a round of applause from the audience. Sylvie's excitement to see Tessia again catches Elijah's attention. He wonders how Art knows about the changes she has undergone and why it seems to matter to him so much. All Art can do is ignore this weirdo. After the entrance ceremony, Elijah and Art decided to take a walk around the campus. Art continues to ignore Elijah, much to his annoyance. While walking, they come across two students arguing with each other. It's a typical student fight between a noble and a dwarf. The noble named Nicholas Drail challenges the dwarf named Brosnian Boar to a duel. The dwarf is quick to agree and initiates the duel using the badge on his uniform. Nicholas accepts the challenge by doing the same gesture with his own badge. As soon as the duel starts, a barrier is formed around each student. These badges are actually artifacts that the school distributes among the students. They form barriers during sanctioned duels within the school. Both students use their magic to summon their weapons. Nicholas summons dual swords while Brosnian summons a huge axe. Elijah is good to cheer on the home team. Art decides to use his own magic to assess both students. Nicholas has a dark red core while Brosnian is a black core augmenter. Braz starts the attack by lunging at Nick using his axe. Nick counterattacks by forming two huge slashes using his earth magic. Art is impressed by his abilities since he was able to conjure earth like that while being an augmenter and having a red core. Braz destroys the earth slashes and continues charging towards Nick. 
He swings the heavy weapon at Nick. However, with quick reflexes, Nick evades the attack and swiftly moves behind his opponent, launching a counterattack with his dual swords. They seem to be equally matched. Braz once again charges towards Nick to close the distance. Nicholas realizes that this is his opportunity. He stabs the ground with one of his swords and flings the dirt toward his opponent. This momentarily blinds him, giving Nick the perfect opportunity to use his earth magic. He uses a spell called Earth Pillar, which lands and breaks Brosnian's barrier. Breaking your opponent's barrier means that the fight has been won. Braz points out the cowardly way that Nicholas fought, but it doesn't matter since a win is a win. The duel should be over since the barrier is broken, but that's not what Nicholas plans to do. He tries to continue his attack and threatens to break Brosnian's arm. Elijah realizes that this might be his chance to become a hero and boldly steps forward. However, his plans are quickly foiled. When Art pretends to spot the student council president, causing Nicholas to become alert and halt his actions. When Nick realizes that was just a prank, he becomes angry and comes over to attack Art. Art tries to de-escalate the situation, telling him that it's not cool to discriminate. This further angers him. He leaves, but not before threatening. This doesn't go over well with Sylvia as she doesn't like anyone threatening her papa, so she decides to get a small revenge by spitting on Nicholas's neck as he walks away. Nicholas becomes furious as he feels insulted by this prank. As he is about to conjure his weapon to attack Art, the fight is stopped by the arrival of the student council. Three members arrive on the scene, including Lilia, Tessia, and the student council's vice president. A few minutes earlier, these three members were walking around the campus and discussing their agenda for the day. However, the only thing on Tessia's mind is how she couldn't find Art during her speech. She starts to wonder if he skipped the ceremony. But that couldn't be because she was informed by Cynthia that he was at the school. She starts imagining different scenarios of how they will meet. She wonders if she should play it cool or perhaps be more friendly. Or maybe he will find her instead. All her thoughts are interrupted by the vice president. As they're walking around, Tessia's sight catches the starting moment of the argument between Nicholas and Art. The vice president quickly recognizes Nicholas from House Drail. He is one of the most promising students that came in last year. Although the vice president doesn't recognize Art from any of the noble houses, so he assumes that he is a commoner. As the argument starts turning into a fight, both Lilia and Tessia quickly get into action. They both realize at once that if they start fighting, Nicholas might end up dead. Tessia quickly steps forward to stop the fight. Nicholas defends himself by telling her that it's all a misunderstanding. He blames Art by telling her that he interrupted the duel. Before Art could start talking, he is interrupted by Lilia as she steps forward to ask him what happened. This comes as a surprise to Tessia, as she didn't know that they already knew each other. Lilia tells her that their fathers work together, and they are old friends. Art further adds that they have been living together for a while. Although it is a bit misleading, the thick-headed Art doesn't realize it. The vice president steps forward and demands an explanation from Nicholas. Even if he was interrupted, that doesn't give him the right to pull out his weapon on a student. He defends himself by stating that he just wanted to scare Art and that he would never have harmed him. The vice president decides to be a little lenient and is about to let Nicholas off the hook. However, Tessa is not so forgiving. She points out that threatening someone with a weapon outside a sanctioned deal is a violation of the student ground rules. She dares him to do the same to her while pointing out that the minimum penalty for such an action is a suspension. If he were to touch a single hair on her head, the minimum penalty would be expulsion. Nicholas is left speechless. She once again asks him if he dares to do it. Just by looking at the expression on her face, Nicholas is left terrified. He quickly bowed down to Art and apologizes for his actions. After everyone leaves, she finally gets the opportunity to talk to Art. She asks him why he's getting into a fight on the first day of school. Although she asks this out of concern, it doesn't go over well with Art. He got annoyed at her for making this assumption after just watching the first five seconds of the situation. However, she tells him that it doesn't matter who is in the wrong. If the situation had escalated, then he would have had to face repercussions. Art continues the argument while pointing out that he did it to protect a student from harm. Elijah interrupts him and tells him to let it go. However, this further annoys him, and he begins to walk away. He is stopped by the vice president named Clive. Tessia tries to stop him, but he tells her that it's unacceptable for someone of Art's stature to talk to her like that. He even goes as far as to say that his lack of manners is because of his poor upbringing. This is the final straw for him. Art uses his wind magic to launch him into the air. Clive lands on his back, but manages to avoid any significant injuries. The annoyed Art leaves, 
finally ending this awkward situation. Back at the dormitory, Tessia is angry with herself for screwing everything up. She had been looking forward to meeting Art all this time, and now he is angry at her. She grabbed her pillow and screams into it out of frustration. She doesn't seem to be able to make up her mind about who was wrong. Conflicting thoughts fill her mind. On one hand, she convinces herself that she was merely looking out for Art's well-being. Considering his tendency to get into trouble, she fears he might lose access to the library and training facilities. On the other hand, a sense of guilt creeps in, making her wonder if she had been too harsh with him, questioning the fairness of her actions. After all, he was the one who got threatened with a weapon. Putting all that aside, the real reason for her anger is that she just found out about Lilia. She even starts to blame Cynthia for making her the student council president. If she wasn't in the student council, their encounter could have gone differently. While she continues sulking, Clive comes up to check up on her. He asks her if she knew Art since he talked so casually to her. He even asks her if he should go to the director about this matter. However, she claims that the matter is settled so it's fine. However, in reality, she knows it's far from okay. Elsewhere, Art and Elijah also began to settle into their rooms. Even Elijah is surprised by Art's reaction earlier. It's not like him to get so worked up. Normally, he would ignore such things and walk off. Yet Art himself doesn't know the answer to this. He wonders if the reason is because it was Tess who said it. As they are unpacking their stuff, they are visited by an unexpected guest. Much to Elijah's shock, this unexpected guest is none other than Cynthia. He quickly bows down and politely welcomes her. Sensing the tension between Art and Cynthia, he excuses himself by telling them that he's going to get drinks. It doesn't take long for her to notice how Sildi has changed, but that's not the only thing she notices. She is only able to sense Art's wind and earth attributes. She comes to the conclusion that he must be using a seal. This disappoints Cynthia, as she had hoped to flaunt her quadra elemental protege. Although she is glad that Art opted for scholar mage instead of battle mage. Art was planning on telling her this when he got the chance to meet her, but he chose not to. This is because he did not want to draw any attention to himself because of Lucas. He didn't want his new enemy to become suspicious of him. Cynthia finds this funny in a way, referring to the brother of Alliance and one of the most influential military houses as a mere enemy. With that being the case, she wonders what kind of monsters his real enemies will be. Putting that aside, Art tells her that he does want her help with something related to his school life. He wants to be able to take the higher level monotheory classes, especially those related to deviants. This wouldn't be a difficult task for the Academy's director. Cynthia is still surprised as she was under the impression that Art wanted to fit in with everyone else. Art realizes his mistake but remains calm and continues the conversation. Cynthia agrees to do this for him and even offers to give him a pass in the upper-class mage's mock battles. This way he can observe magic being used in real combat. Art is intrigued by this offer, but he soon realizes that there must be a catch. This is around the same time that Elijah arrives with their drinks. He starts yelling at Art for being rude to the director. He is made to feel silly when Cynthia confesses to having an ulterior motive. She explains that the student councils are like the shield of this school. This year she has decided to make a disciplinary committee, the swords that she wants Art to join. The academy is full of young hormonal mages filled with pride. This often leads to problems. The disciplinary committee will be the one responsible for upholding the peace and enforcing the rules on the school grounds. Art wonders if he is fit to join this committee. He is a first-year student and he's not even a battle mage. Cynthia gives a short and satisfying answer. It's her school and therefore her rules. Art decides that it would be too much trouble to join the disciplinary committee and refuses the offer. He tells her that he doesn't need the theory classes and he will just teach himself from the books in the library. Nonetheless, Cynthia came prepared for such a response. She tells him that those books are inaccessible for underclassmen, and even if he was an upperclassman, he would have to reveal that he's a deviant to use those books. This is something that Art does not want to do. Elijah is surprised by the unusual relationship, which does not resemble the relationship between a director and a student at all. Cynthia decides to sweeten the pot. She offers to give Art access to a private training facility. There is one concern that he has, and that's whether Lucas has a spot on the disciplinary committee or not. She assures him that despite House Wyke's insistence on giving Lucas a spot, she declined. This is because she had hoped to give this spot to him. After hearing this, Art finally agrees to become part of the committee. She wastes no time and gives him his new uniform, which he will have to wear as a part of the disciplinary committee. 
It is revealed that Cynthia had predicted their entire conversation as she tells Art that she already had a uniform tailored for him. This pisses him off as he doesn't like to be so predictable. Before leaving, Cynthia advised Art to make up with Tessia, as it is not a good thing to be mad at your childhood friend. Elijah is left completely amazed as he realizes that Art is friends with Princess Aerolith. While on a walk around the campus, Art apologizes to Elijah for not telling him sooner. Elijah does have a childhood friend of his own in a way, however he decides to skip out on details, which in my opinion is for the best. Despite Art's apology, Elijah just cannot move on from the fact that Art knows so many beautiful girls, Lilia, then Princess Cathinon, and now even Princess Tessia. Next, he might as well be flirting with the gods. Art tells him that he didn't flirt with anyone which makes it even worse. He seems to be getting all the girls without even trying unlike Elijah, who has been trying a bit too hard. He hypothesizes that maybe Art just oozes out attractive pheromones. As they go to the cafeteria for dinner, Art starts attracting the attention of everyone there. It seems that the rumors about his encounter with Nicholas have already started spreading. He pays them no attention, as he is already used to this kind of treatment by now. Long after they start eating, they are approached by a group of students. They approach Elijah and tell him that he's wasting his time with someone beneath him. The leader introduces himself as Charles Ravenpoop II from the famous House Ravenpoop. He is feeling rather magnanimous today and offers to let Elijah join his group. Instead of taking him seriously, the two boys burst out laughing after hearing the name of his house. They cannot believe that a noble family would be named after bird feces. Angered by their insult, he throws away Elijah's food, so he fires back by telling him that he would never go with someone who blatantly looks down on his best friend. Instead of looking down on scholar mages, they should treat everyone equally, like the student council president said. Charles reminds him that it's something the student council says because it's politically correct and it's for appearances. In reality, there is a huge difference between scholar mages and battle mages. This would normally be true, but that's not the case when it comes to art. Charles tries to prove his point by attacking art, but art easily brushes his attack off using his wind magic. Charles is not ready to accept it and tells himself that it must be a fluke. He goes in for another attack. This time, Elijah steps in front of Art to protect him. Although Art could easily get away with magic, he doesn't want to lead his friend to get attacked. To everyone's surprise, the attack is stopped by a couple of vines. These vines wrap themselves around his body and quickly restrain him. Any normal student would not be capable of using such powerful deviant magic, though Art realizes that it could only be one person. This is confirmed when he sees Tessia leaving the room. Now the question remains what to do with him. If they were to use magic, then they would surely get into trouble. So Art comes up with the perfect plan. Charles starts throwing out his threat, telling them that they will not get away with this when his mother finds out. As he senses pressure coming off from Art, the terror leaves him speechless, and even Elijah becomes concerned. Art starts gathering mana on his right hand. Clearly he's about to attack him. Yet what unfolds next leaves everyone utterly astonished. With one swing of his hand, Art pulls his pant right down to his ankles, leaving him exposed for everyone to witness. This might even be more cruel than physical injury. Art decides to take his leave after putting Charles' dignity right into the ground. When he goes out of the building, he sees Tessia sitting on a bench. This is exactly what he had hoped for, a chance to talk to her alone. Art thanks her for her help with Charles. Having met after so long, both of them don't know what to say. He tries to break the awkward silence by apologizing for his behavior earlier. Though his apologies met with the headboard, just like the good old times, as Tessia tries to apologize herself, she cannot help but start crying a little bit. But she makes up the excuse that it's because her head's hurting. She leans her head on his shoulder and Art comforts her by patting her. She was worried that Art hated her. He assures her that no matter how many times he gets mad at her, he can never hate her. He once again apologizes for what happened earlier. He knew she was looking out for her, so he shouldn't have lashed out. Their moment is interrupted by Elijah's arrival. He came here to tell them that Ravenpoop has finally managed to get out of the vines. When he witnesses them all snuggled up, the look on his face is enough to tell everyone what he's thinking. He quickly only excuses himself to not interrupt their romantic moment. At least that's what he thinks. Art asks her if she would like to go on a walk with him so they can talk more. He tells her all about his adventures for the past two years. Art is surprised to learn that Virian is so close to Cynthia. Tessia reveals that this was the reason why she was able to become Cynthia's disciple. Art assures her that her skills had more to do with it. 
now that she has finally gotten to spend some time with him, she begins to notice how much Art has changed in these past couple of years. The way he moves and talks, there's so much purpose behind it. Not to mention, he has become much more good-looking as well. She starts to feel jealous of Jasmine for getting to spend two years with him. It starts to get late, so Art suggests going back to their dorms before they get into trouble. Before they leave, Art has a little gift for Tessia. It's the Elderwood Guardian's Beast Corps that he had saved up. Although she had heard about it from Cynthia, she is still surprised. She couldn't be happier to receive such a precious gift from him. When he finally gets back to his room, he's greeted by Elijah's ghost. This ghost was formed probably after he died of jealousy. He immediately wants an explanation for what he witnessed earlier. Even after Art explains everything, Elijah is still in disbelief that Art is friends with the Lunar Goddess. This is the nickname that the students have bestowed upon her. Her beauty and radiance are like the moon, but Art got to touch the moon and snuggle with the moon. This is the reason for Elijah's anger. Art quickly knocks him out with his pillow and goes to sleep. The long-awaited day has finally dawned as it's his first official day as a student at Osiris Academy and as a member of the disciplinary committee. Art puts on his new uniform and walks to the club room. This sure catches the attention of all the nearby students who are still unaware of the disciplinary committee. It's finally time for Art to meet the so-called strongest students of Exiris Academy. As soon as he opens the door, a huge lion jumps in front of him and roars with all his might. Sylvie holds on for her dear life to not get blown away. Despite the powerful roar, it fails to get a reaction out of Art. All it manages to do is piss Sylvie off and cover him with drool. This was supposed to be an elaborate welcome prank by one of the senior members of the committee, but it obviously failed. This guy is a fourth year named Kai Crestless. Art returns the polite greeting and introduces himself as well as Sylvie, who is busy taking down the mighty lion. Even Kai is surprised to see this and wonders what sort of a beast she is for her to be able to render Grotter so submissive. Their conversation is interrupted by another member of the committee. She's a tough-looking grawny first year. One look at her and Art is reminded of Helgarth, Elijah's childhood friend. However, thankfully, that's not the case. She introduces herself as Deridria Oregard. She extends a polite hand while introducing herself, but he just slaps it away, clearly showing his macho and tough guy personality. The three of them head off to meet the rest of the DC officers who are waiting in the next room. The first person Art notices upon entering the room is Prince Curtis. It's no surprise that a member of the royal family would be part of the committee. Even he is surprised to see his bond grotter acting so scared. It seems he fell to the mighty Sylvie, who now uses the lion as a personal carriage. Upon seeing Curtis, Art instantly realizes that this world lion is the same one that he purchased at Helstie's auction house. They greet each other like old friends. Curtis is not the only member of the royal family to be on the disciplinary committee. It seems Princess Catherine is a member as well, which is hardly a surprise. However, the next member is indeed a very big surprise. It's Ferith Evsar, the same elf that Art met during his time in the Elven Kingdom. Art calls him by his nickname Feifei. This pisses him off, but at the same time gets a laugh out of all the other members of the disciplinary committee. Although Ferith is a first year just like Art, he is still a few years older than him. So Art should treat him with respect, but knowing Art's personality, that's not going to happen. The last two members also arrive to introduce themselves. Firstly, it's Claire Bladeheart. Being a sixth-year student, she's the most senior member of the committee and also their leader. Art instantly recognizes the name Bladeheart. It's the same last name as Caspian. She confirms that Caspian is her uncle. She asks Art if he knows him. He decides to keep his connection to Caspian a secret and instead tells her that he has heard a lot of great things about him. The last member of the disciplinary committee is Theo. Unlike everyone else, he is not so welcoming. He is not satisfied with the weak and scrawny-looking Art, so he decides to give him a test. As they shake hands, he unleashes his gravity magic on him. Being as strong as he is, even Art has to use his own magic to counter the full force of Theo's gravity magic. If it wasn't for his assimilation with Sylvie's beast will, even Art wouldn't have been able to withstand it. Theo, as well as all the other members of the disciplinary committee, are impressed that Art is able to withstand gravity magic. This is something that Feifei failed miserably. He tries to defend himself by telling everyone that he is a conjurer and Theo is an augmenter. Before this could go any further, Claire puts an end to their argument. She tells them to stop fighting and put their game face on for the club's announcement. 
This will be the very first time the DC officers will show their faces to the rest of the students. This is something that Art wasn't aware of, but Curtis tells him that there's nothing to worry about. The student council will be the one making the announcement and they just have to come onto the stage and look tough. With an A-class Mana Beast on their side, this task shouldn't be very difficult. The announcement starts with Tessia's speech. She tells everyone about the disciplinary committee stating that these are hand-picked students by the director herself to resolve and prevent disputes among students. They will enforce punishment on the troublemakers for the sake of upholding peace. With a round of applause, the disciplinary committee members all walk onto the stage as a group. Art's student life has started in full swing. It's time for his first class as a student. Because of the club rush announcement, Art has become the subject of all the gossip. As expected, he is not very happy about this. The fact that he's one of the only eight students wearing a black uniform doesn't really help his cause. The class begins as the professor walks in. Judging from the wand hanging by his waist, he is a conjurer. After putting his books down on the table, he introduces himself to the rest of the class. His name is Professor Avius, and he'll be teaching the class known as the Fundamentals of Mana Theory. The professor is well aware that this class is not very popular among the students. It's obviously because it's all about boring theory without any practical magic use. Before they start covering the syllabus, the teacher decides to address the conjurers are better than augmenter stigma. In the olden days when achieving an orange core was considered a huge achievement, conjurers had a big advantage over augmenters. Conjurers typically have much more developed mana veins, which are responsible for absorbing mana and transporting it to the core. Meanwhile, augmenters have much more developed mana channels. These are responsible for the distribution of mana from the core to the rest of the body. Since conjurers are more efficient at absorbing mana, it is easier for them to ascend to the next level. This was the reason for their advantage. However, as both types of mages ascend, the differences become less pronounced. Conjurers become more efficient at distributing mana throughout their body, while augmenters gain better remote mana manipulation. The teacher raises a question for the whole class. If two mages, one conjurer and one augmenter both reach the silver core stage, who would have the advantage? The answer is simple. The mage who has both great mana distribution and manipulation will be the winner. The rest of the lecture continued with some of the conjurer students arguing with the professor's claims. The debate used hypotheticals and previously recorded duels between high-ranking mages. However, in the end, the discussion did seem to lead the students with an open mind. So all in all, one could say the professor achieved what he had hoped to do. As soon as this class ends, Art immediately heads out for his next class. He says goodbye to Elijah while telling him to save him a seat at lunch. This lecture hall is designed more like the training field at the Adventures Guild. It's quite obvious that this lecture will be a practical one. Art is quite enjoying his life as a student. He gets to relax and sit around, unlike when he was an adventurer. His peaceful time is interrupted by Princess Catherine. She wants to sit next to him. Being polite, he tells her to go right ahead, yet in reality, he would rather be left alone. It seems that a peaceful time is just not in the cards for Art as even Ferrith wants to sit next to him. The lecture finally begins as the teacher makes his way. As expected, the practical lecture is quite crowded, unlike the previous theory class. It doesn't take long for Art to realize that his new teacher is the same drunk that he met before joining the academy. The class is known as practical mana manipulation and what better way to learn this other than engaging in physical combat. Keeping in line with his nature, the teacher quickly starts scouting the students for cute girls. When his eyes meet Art, he is instantly able to recognize him as the student who humiliated him. He starts laughing inwardly as he has finally gotten his opportunity to get revenge. He tells the class that it's an honor to teach the newly formed disciplinary committee. Since everyone is wondering what the new DC officers are made of, he gives them an opportunity to volunteer and show their strength. This is an obvious move to humiliate the DC officers in front of everyone. No idiot would fall for this. No idiot except one, I guess. Hearing the teacher's words, Ferrith instantly raises his hand and volunteers. He boasts about how they are handpicked students by the director herself. It's made all too easy for the teacher, who was looking for just this opportunity. Ferrith walks down to the field and introduces himself to the teacher. Judging from the fact that he cannot sense the teacher's mana core level, he realizes that the teacher is much stronger than him. The teacher even decides to give him a handicap. Even though he's an augmenter, he will only use long-range attacks. This also gives him an excuse in case he loses. Both of them activated the barriers using their badges and starts the duel. Ferrith begins with a spell called Flood Domain. 
This is a high-tier spell that adjusts the territory to be more advantageous to the caster. Art is impressed that Ferith can use such a spell. He follows it up with a spell called Water Serpent. It summons a huge snake that charges towards his opponent. The teacher finds the level of the spell too easy to counter, effortlessly summoning blue flames on his right hand in preparation for an attack. It becomes evident that the drunk wasn't all talk. The blue flames effortlessly obliterate the serpent and now head directly towards Ferith. At the last moment, the teacher redirects the spell, and it attacks Ferith's leg. With just one attack, he manages to destroy the barrier and emerge victorious. This is an obvious attempt to boost his ego by purposefully humiliating Ferith. Ferith makes his way back to his chair. Art tries to uplift his spirit by telling him that he did a good job. The teacher, on the other hand, is not done humiliating him. He tells the class that Mr. Ivsar should have been able to protect himself against his spell, but clearly he wasn't strong enough. To everyone's surprise, the next one to volunteer is Princess Kathleen. She is an ice magic user. She volunteers despite knowing that she would be at a disadvantage against a teacher who is a fire magic user. Both Ferith and Art become concerned. It would be a big deal if the princess gets injured. As she makes her way down to the training field, the teacher introduces himself and tells her not to hold it against him. With a simple nod, she agrees. She summons her wand and the battle begins. She starts the battle by firing icicle lances. The teacher easily defends himself. He uses his fire magic to melt all the ice lances. She continues her barrage of ice lances. He counterattacks by throwing fireballs toward her. Art instantly recognizes this spell as the same one that Lucas used during the rank examination. Princess Kathleen counters the fireballs by blocking them using her ice lances. This breaks the huge ice lances into smaller pieces that could be used as missiles. The teacher once again uses the same spell to throw more fireballs at her. This is where the princess makes a grave error. Instead of defending herself, she goes all out on the attack and uses Ice Tornado. This leads her completely defenseless against the incoming attack. Ferith, being a conjurer himself, instantly recognizes the mistake. With no way to stop the spell, the teacher realizes the horrible situation he has created. As the spell makes contact, a huge blast erupts, leaving all the students in utter shock. After the smoke clears, everyone is relieved to see that the princess is safe. It seems that Art managed to get her away from the blast just in time. Instead of admitting to his mistake, he tells Art that his help was unnecessary. He lies and tells everyone that he had complete control of his spell. The lie seemed to have fooled all the less experienced students in the class. He further explains that he was about to cancel the spell just before it made contact. But Art knows that to be a lie, Having witnessed the same spell being used by Lucas, he knows there is no way to cancel the spell after it has been used. Since he has no proof of the teacher's wrongdoing for now, he is unable to do anything. So, the only logical thing is to find proof. He comes up with a plan to force the teacher to screw up against him. If he gets hurt, then he will have clear evidence of the teacher's mistake. To put his plan into action, he decides to switch places with Kathleen. Art summons his sword and prepares to face the teacher. Unlike the previous two battles, this time both of the participants are augmenters, so the teacher asks Art what method he would prefer for their fight. Art knows that he is stronger than him, so he tells him that it doesn't matter. Upon the teacher's continued insistence, Art tells him that he should use the method that he's most confident in. Hence, the teacher finally decides to bring out his weapon. It's a sword enhanced by his blue flames. Although the teacher tells him that he would go easy on him, it soon becomes apparent that he has no intention of doing so. He charges at Art with full force. Their epic battle starts as both of their weapons clash. The teacher continues his barrage of attacks without giving Art any chance to rest. However, instead of firing back, Art enhances his body with his mana and continues dodging every one of his attacks. This comes as an annoyance for the teacher as he realizes that Art is looking down on him. He becomes more aggressive and starts attacking more furiously. Art takes another jab at him by pointing out the fact that he's unable to land a single hit on a first-year student. This increases the teacher's frustration even more. Unable to control his anger any longer, he goes all out and uses his most powerful spell. Yet Art continues to calmly dodge all his attacks. The students begin to realize that this is no longer a practice battle. Ferith even considers calling the student council. After dodging his attacks for long enough, Art finally decides to counterattack. With just one lunge, he nearly decapitates the teacher, forcing him to jump back in order to dodge. The teacher finally realizes the trouble he is in. Art uses his powerful attacks as well as his wind magic. 
Both Ferith and the princess are shocked by what they're witnessing. Art decides to finally end the battle. He uses his wind magic to create powerful gusts of wind and forces the teacher into a corner. His barrage of wind attacks finally starts to crack the teacher's barrier. He is left helpless, unable to defend himself. The barrage of wind attacks finally manages to break the barrier, resulting in an absolute victory for Art. His victory is met with a round of applause from all the students. Art notices Princess Cathan leaving the class, so he decides to follow her along with Ferith. Before he can approach her, he is stopped by Ferith, who congratulates him on his victory. He admits that Art was quite impressive, which is to be expected from his rival. He returns the praise by telling Ferith that he did quite well himself. If he had known the type of spell that Professor Geist would use, then he would have prepared accordingly. This way he would have surely won. Hearing this, the princess decides to come back to get an assessment of her own performance. Art decides to be blunt and points out her mistake of ignoring her defense to finish the last spell. An awkward silence ensues as both the boys worry about what her reaction would be. She gives him a simple nod and walks away, much to their relief. Without wasting much time, Art decides to head off for his next class. Despite his victory, he doesn't seem very happy. This fact is noticed by Sildi. The reason for Art's dissatisfaction is that he couldn't finish off the professor quickly using just his wind attribute. This has made him realize that he has to work a lot harder to get better. He finally reaches his next classroom. This lecture will be about the basics of artificing. The classroom is a huge laboratory filled with different kinds of equipment. This might be the first challenging class he has had all day. This is because he didn't study this in his previous life. Art is approached by a nerdy looking girl. She wants to know if the seat next to him is taken or not. Art politely welcomes her to take the seat. Just like a true nerd, she seems to be an introvert too shy to even introduce herself properly. She does, however, manage to get a few words out and tells him her name, which is Emily Watskin. The awkwardness continues as she struggles to communicate properly. Art takes the conversational pressure off of her and introduces himself. As they shake hands, Art realizes how rough her hands are. This is an obvious indicator that she's a hard-working student. She quickly apologizes to Art, telling him that her hands must feel gross. Art tells her that it's quite all right since his own hands are the same way. Emily loves artificing and ends up fiddling around with gadgets all day long. This is the reason her hands have become so rough. Art admires this fact about her. In fact, he can't help but feel a little jealous that she has something that she is so passionate about. With fighting, all he is able to do is destroy and kill. But with artificing, Emily has the chance to create new things. She is quite moved by his deep sentiments. It has been quite a while since anyone said anything like this to her. Not since she created the projection display artifact. It's the same artifact that was used during the announcement of the new continent. Art is left surprised by how much of a genius Emily is. She also seems to know everything about Art, from the fact that he defeated a professor as well as his fight with Caspian. It is a school after all, where news travels fast and gossip travels even faster. The class finally starts as the professor makes his way in. The professor is none other than Gideon. He goes on and on about all his different inventions. Instead of teaching, it seems like he intends to use this lecture to brag about himself. As the lecture goes on, a mysterious mana beast suddenly starts flying towards the classroom. It enters the class and lands on Art's shoulder. Sylvie instantly puts her guard up, telling Art that this mana beast is dangerous. However, her worries seem to be all for naught. This mana beast is Cynthia's bond. The mana beast landing on Art's shoulder means that the director is calling him. He excuses himself from the class and makes his way to Cynthia's office. As he reaches the office, he sees Princess Kathleen coming out. She slams the door behind her in anger as she leaves. This is obviously a bad sign. Art enters the office and waits nervously to find out what this is all about. He is worried that perhaps he is going to be punished because of his fight with Professor Geist. But since the director tells him that she did not call him in regards to that, instead she has an offer for him. She asks him if he would like to be an interim professor for the practical mana manipulation class. Art is left completely stunned. He cannot believe that he's being offered to be a professor. He even checks behind him to make sure that she's talking to him. He wonders what exactly Kathleen told her for things to come to this. At this point, it's hardly a surprise that Art is on a first-name basis with the Princess of Sapin. He might end up causing a civil war if he steals the heart of not one but two princesses from different kingdoms. Yet he quickly brushes that thought aside to talk about more serious matters. He is a first-year student who hasn't even finished his first day of school. He questions, 
whether it would even be possible for someone like him to become a professor. Cynthia calms him down and tells him that it's quite simple. As long as the director allows it, it's possible. In fact, there have been cases where highly qualified upperclassmen started teaching basic courses. So contrary to what he might think, this is not that special. But if Hart would start teaching the class, what would happen to Professor Geist? Cynthia quickly answers this question by telling him that he has been dismissed from the academy. This does come as a surprise to Art. She also tells him that shortly after she heard what happened in the class, she had an investigation launched against him. With Kathleen's help, he had no room to defend himself. She even mentions that she has never seen Kathleen so angry before. But something like that would be hard for Art to notice. After all, he is not the emotional type. In any case, Art starts wondering why Cynthia is doing this. What ulterior motives does she have this time? She assures him that it's just a simple coincidence. A spot opened up and she just wants him to fill it. She doesn't have any hidden intentions this time. This would be a good opportunity for him to build his reputation and Cynthia wouldn't have to worry about Art going around conquering her professors. Although this will put him into the spotlight to some extent, she reassures him that it would be well placed to defend him if necessary. Parents are bound to complain, but it is still better than canceling the clause altogether. Cynthia leaves the choice up to Art. She still urges him to accept the offer as it would be a better use of his time than sitting through a class, which he's clearly overqualified for. Since his plan to keep a low profile has already been ruined, he decides to accept the offer. With that, Art leaves for his classes. Cynthia discusses their meeting with her bond. There is something about Art that always keeps her on her toes. Even negotiating with the royal families isn't as nerve-wracking for her as it is when she's dealing with Art. She asks her bond, Avier, for his opinion on the matter. He tells Cynthia that Art is different. Whether it's his mental acuity or emotional maturity, there is much more to him than the eye meets. He says this because of Sylvie. After just one meeting with her, Avier has realized that Sylvie is actually a dragon. This revelation leaves Cynthia speechless. Avier even states that in time his strength will become incomparable to Sylvie's. He warns her not to make an enemy out of Art. If treated right, he could become her greatest ally. But on the other hand, if he's betrayed, then he may be the cause of Decathan's demise. Art makes his way to the cafeteria. There he meets up with Elijah, who is busy talking to a girl. This is quite unusual. Normally, girls tend to avoid him. Nevertheless, Art takes a seat beside him. Elijah introduces her as Charlotte. While talking about their classes, Elijah mentions that he especially liked the chain casting and mana utilization classes. And that's also where he met Charlotte. She is his classmate from the chain casting class. Elijah inquires about how Art's classes are going. He had already heard that Art beat up a professor, but he doesn't know anything more than that. When Art reveals that he's going to be teaching that same class, Elijah spits out his food from shock. While wiping his face, he once again states that he ended up replacing the teacher who taught that class, so he shouldn't be going around spitting his food on a professor. Elijah becomes intrigued and even mentions that he might end up ditching his class to see him in action. On the topic of ditching classes, he tells that he and Charlotte are going shopping. He invites Art to join them. For some reason, this gets her really excited. Art politely declines the offer, telling him that he has three more classes to attend. Hearing this, the girl also makes up the excuse that she has a plan for today, and maybe they can go shopping some other time. Now it finally starts to make sense why a girl would be hanging out with Elijah. She probably just wanted to become friends with Art, so she was using Elijah to get to him, However, his dim-witted friend doesn't realize it. He goes on and on about how she's so nice and pretty, and even asks Art if he has a shot with her. Not wanting to hurt his feelings, he tells him that he can do a lot better. Art makes his way to his next class. It's an upper division class, so it would be quite unusual for a first year to get there. Hence, the murmurs quickly start as he makes his way there. He finds Claire and Curtis standing there as well, so he decides to join them. Not long after, Tessia and Clive also made their way there. While he's standing there waiting for the class to begin, he finally meets his enemy at the Exaris Academy. Arrogant, deceitful, and treacherous are the qualities that define the person that Lucas Wykes is. Not long after their by-chance encounter, the whole class hears a screeching noise. It seems that their teacher has finally arrived. She certainly knows how to make an entrance as she arrives riding on a giant eagle. Upon landing, she welcomes the students, followed by an introduction. Her name is Professor Glory, and she'll be their instructor for the Teen Fighting Mechanics 1 course. Her bond is a flare hawk named Torch. Art uses his magic to see how strong the professor is. 
but his attempt fails and he finds it quite weird. Why would she feel the need to hide her level and her elemental attributes among a bunch of students? As usual, Art quickly catches the teacher's eye. She walks up to him to meet her newest colleague. It seems she intends to put the spotlight on Art. The rest of the class becomes curious and asks the professor if it's really true. She makes no effort to hide the fact that Art is not only a freshman DC officer, but will also be teaching the mana manipulation class as a professor. Anger and jealousy fill all the upperclassmen. They cannot believe that this scrawny freshman will be teaching a class, an opportunity that not even some of the best upperclassmen get. Professor Glory seems to have succeeded in her attempt to put a target on Art's back. Now she tries to calm everyone by telling them that they should believe in the director's decision. She states that Art has proven himself by defeating a professor. Yet this has the opposite effect as the students get even more riled up. They believe that anyone can beat an underclassman professor, especially one that was some thug adventurer. Seeing the students all fired up, she comes up with an idea. She offers them a chance to test the new professor of the practical mana manipulation class. Their intentions become clear as they stare at Art with bloodthirsty eyes. It's as if they're wolves stalking their prey. Art tries to politely decline the offer, but his answer is not acceptable to the professor. She states that he only needs to prove himself through a demonstration, which is only fair for all the students. It seems that it's too late to do anything about it, and Art's only option is to go through with it. The demonstration will be in the form of a game that she likes to play at the start of every semester. But her idea of a game seems to be a bit too extreme. So instead, Curtis makes a suggestion. He suggests a team mock battle with the three disciplinary committee officers on one team. This way they can test not only Art, but also the disciplinary committee. Clive makes a proposition of his own. He suggests he and Tessia be on the other team. Things have started to get more interesting as it has now become a battle between the disciplinary committee and the student council. Regardless as of now, the student council only has two members, while the disciplinary committee has three, so it would be unfair. This problem is solved as Lucas volunteers to be on the student council's team. He is the other genius freshman that is attending an upper division class. With everything set, the students get ready to start their battle. Everyone puts on their uniform and their fighting gear. Before starting their match, Professor Glory explains the rules to everyone. The match will have a time limit of 30 minutes, after which they will have a short discussion and analysis session. Since Curtis and Claire have had more classical training than the two first years on the student council team, the DC team is given a handicap. Art is made the king of the team. This means that if the opponent team can knock him out, then the entire team loses. The gear that they are using are artifacts designed to measure the amount of damage dealt. If the damage crosses a certain limit, the gear will make a shrill noise indicating that they are out. Anyone who decides to ignore this warning and continue fighting will be immediately banned from this class and might even face expulsion. She makes it clear that their equipment is not designed to protect them. They should be able to protect themselves with mana. With all the explanations done, Professor gives the signal to commence the battle. Everyone quickly leaps into action. Claire goes after Clive, while Curtis and Grotter go against Tessia. Though Curtis probably won't be able to beat Tessia, he should be able to hold her off long enough. As Art scans the battlefield, he sees Lucas arrogantly walking toward him. Art was under the wrong impression that Lucas might have become more humble after coming to Exiris Academy. But that's not the case. As expected of Lucas, he started making sarcastic comments about how Art is scared of losing to him and destroying his reputation. Professor Glory is closely observing their battle from above while riding on torch. As usual, shortly after Art releases his mana, everyone on the battlefield can sense his immense strength. He uses his wind magic to launch himself and dashes toward Lucas at great speed. In response, Lucas uses his domain spell called Inferno's Cage. As the name suggests it covers an area with a wall of fire, Art manages to save himself from the flames by using his earth magic. Next, Lucas uses the same fireball spell he used during their rank examination. The spell is much stronger than it was back then. He creates hundreds of fireballs floating on top of them. And since they are still trapped in the Inferno's cage, Art cannot run away. With Lucas's command, the fireballs start falling toward Art. As soon as they hit the ground, they start exploding. Art barely manages to dodge them. But at this rate, it's only a matter of time before one of them hits him. Lucas couldn't be happier seeing Art struggle because of his spell. Sylvie gets concerned and contacts Art telepathically. Despite his current situation, he assures her that he's fine and asks her how the others are doing. As expected, Tessia is winning against Curtis, 
while Claire is against Clive. Slowly, the fireballs get more and more intense. There seems to be no end to them. This is because, with Lucas's growing strength, his mana pool has also increased greatly. Art tries to attack him directly, yet he finds his path blocked by more fireballs. Without his fire and water attributes, he seems to be struggling against the heat. On top of that, he knows that his mana pool is not as great as Lucas's, so if it comes down to a battle of stamina, he's sure to lose. Lucas starts making fun of Art saying that he's glad he's not on the disciplinary committee because he could never be on the same team as someone as incompetent as him. Art ignores the insult to focus on defense. He continues to use his earth magic to defend himself against the fireballs. He is also unable to counterattack because of his inefficiency with the wind attribute. As expected, he slowly starts to take damage. He is even forced to pull out his sword, but he can still only hope to guard himself. He needs to come up with a plan quickly to counter Lucas, otherwise he will certainly lose. Simply put, wind magic is pushing and pulling. It's about manipulating the air to achieve the desired effect. But what if Art were to manipulate the air particles themselves? This way he could get rid of the very thing that keeps a fire burning, oxygen. Nevertheless, this would require intense concentration. And with Art being forced to protect himself from the constant attacks, Will he be able to manipulate the particles fast enough to extinguish the fire? If he's unable to do so, then he would leave himself defenseless against Lucas's attack. Art finds this funny in a way. Normally, he wouldn't be thinking so much, so he tells himself to stop thinking and just do it. The professor becomes impressed with Lucas's performance. He's much better than she had heard. Inferno's Cage is one of the tougher flame attribute domain spells, and yet he's able to use it so proficiently, and at such a young age. On top of that, his mana reserves rival that of a silver core mage. On the other hand, Art is no less impressive. She notes that he lacks variation in his spells, but makes up for it with his fluid movement and tight control. The lack of variation is a result of his lack of experience with these two elements, but the professor is unaware of that. She was only mildly curious about the kid who was able to defeat a veteran adventurer. But the pressure she felt when Art released his mana was something she had never expected. She wonders what kind of life he has lived to be capable of that at such a young age. On the battlefield, Art decides to put his plan into action. He takes a deep breath because after he starts using the magic, he might not be able to breathe. Unable to defend himself while concentrating, Art starts taking damage from the fireballs. He ignores the pain and continues moving toward Lucas. Slowly but surely, his plan starts to work. Even Professor Glory is left amazed, she flies in closer to get a better look as she is unable to believe what she's witnessing. Unlike wind magic, trying to manipulate air itself requires much more insight and a higher level of concentration. This is why mages are unable to suck the air out of their opponent's lungs. It would take hours of concentration to manipulate the air inside a moving target. Hence, many just use their bodies as a source or a pre-designated unmovable location. Art keeps the area of effect as close to his body as possible. Even then, to be able to do what he's doing is nothing short of amazing. He creates a thin layer of vacuum around his body. Because of this, he's able to walk through the fire as if it were nothing. Regardless, it's not perfect, and he continues to take damage little by little. At this rate, will his uniform be able to hold out before he reaches Lucas? With his spells being continuously blocked, Lucas is getting nervous as Art approaches him. He decides to use an all-out spell to finish it in one blow. He uses the Flame Guardian spell to summon a Fire Elemental. This brings a smile to Art's face as he realizes that Lucas is at his limit. Just as Art is about to counter the Flame Guardian, he suddenly feels a surge of mana. This is followed by a message from Sylvie telling him that Tessia is in danger. With him being distracted, the Flame Guardian attacks him and nearly takes him out. Due to the constant attacks from the Flame Guardian, Art is unable to do anything. He finds himself backed up into a corner and is forced to use his trump card. He uses the static void to freeze time for everyone. Because of his fight with Lucas, Art doesn't have much mana left, so he has to work fast. He finally realizes what is happening. The surge of mana that he felt earlier was Curtis realizing his beast will. He seems to have launched a powerful spell toward Tessia. And for some reason, she isn't defending herself. If this spell had made contact, Tessia would surely have been in a lot of danger. Art starts to feel the pain from using Static Void. Despite the pain, he crawls to Tessia to protect her. But he soon comes to a chilling realization. He doesn't have enough mana to block the powerful attack. There is only one thing he can do now. As the Static Void runs out, 
He hugs Tessia to be a human shield for her. Both of them become completely enveloped in a beam of light. A few minutes ago, Tessia had been engaged in a battle with Curtis. Due to her training with Virian, she is much stronger than Curtis and had no problem blocking his attacks. Prince had to give his all just to keep up with her. As he went in for another attack, she easily dodges it and prepares to counterattack. Just when it seems like it's all over for him, Tessia suddenly feels a throbbing pain in her mana core. Due to being distracted by the pain, the power of her attack is reduced. Even though Curtis is hit by the attack and is sent flying, he comes out of it relatively unscathed. Tessia is confused about what is happening to her, but still chooses to power through it and continue fighting. Since Curtis's attacks have not been working, he decides to use his beast will. He starts gathering a large amount of mana to fire a powerful spell. Tessia realizes this and decides to use a protective spell. Her body becomes covered with vines. These vines also attack Curtis and Grotter to disrupt their concentration. They skillfully dodge the vines while getting closer and closer to her. With the pain getting increasingly intense, the princess begins to lose her strength. She realizes that this is probably because of the Elderwood Guardian's beast will that she got from Art. She always has the option to forfeit, but her pride would not allow that. After all, she is the student council president, so she cannot have anyone thinking that she's weak, much less a coward. After having gathered enough mana, Curtis launches a powerful spell called the World's Howl. The pain from her mana core becomes so intense that Tessia starts to faint, leaving her completely defenseless to the incoming attack. Just as she's about to lose consciousness, she sees Art suddenly appear in front of her. A huge blast occurs as the attack makes contact. Professor finally arrives, but she is too late. Both Art and Tessia lie unconscious on the ground. The professor is surprised to see Art there since no one saw him moving in. Curtis becomes worried and starts apologizing to Professor Glory, telling her that he did not mean for this to happen. But right now the most important thing is to get unconscious students to the medical ward. She quickly orders the standby team to start the damage assessment. Some time has passed and Art wakes up in a hospital. He's covered in bandages with Sylvie standing on top of him. She's angry with him for always putting himself in near-death situations. Art pats her head and apologizes for always making her worry. He gets visited by Cynthia. She has come to see how he is doing. He asks her about Tessia's condition. Because he protected her, her injuries are not as bad as his. Yet there is another problem. As Art has already realized the problem, it is the beast's will that he gave her. As always, he starts blaming himself for their condition. But Cynthia tells him that it's her fault for keeping her beast will a secret. If she had at least told the professor, this situation could have been avoided. She thanked him for saving her disciple. Before leaving, Cynthia tells him that she has contacted both his and Tessia's family, so they should be here soon. As she leaves the room, she finds Tessia standing outside the door. She wants to go in and meet Art, but she can't seem to find the courage to do so. Cynthia tries to cheer her up by joking about eating desserts that were brought in for them. Nonetheless, Tessia can't stop thinking about Art. After some time, Art's family finally arrives, as always, Alice is very worried about him. Art apologizes to everyone for always worrying them. Ellie, on the other hand, tries to hide her worry behind a snarky comment. This is confirmed when Ray reveals that she had been crying even more than his mom. Alice asks him how he got hurt so badly on his first day of school. When Ray suggests that he must have gotten into a fight, Art decides to play along and jokingly suggests that the other guy got the worst of it. They all see the humor in it other than Alice. Knowing his strength, she feels that he might have obliterated some poor child. The conversation is interrupted as the royal family arrives to visit Art. Both Ray and Alice are left shocked. They quickly bow down to greet the King of Eleanor. The King tells them that it's not necessary. They have been eager to meet the parents of the child who saved their daughter not once, but twice. Ray also greets Virian and they finally get to meet Tessia. She introduces herself as a friend of Art. Yet judging from the cheeky smiles on their faces, they seem to have misunderstood. They had heard so much about Tessia from Art, but this is their first time meeting her. Alice jokingly suggests that they're going to be together in the future, leaving Tessia completely embarrassed. Even Virian decides to play along. Now that all the greetings are done, Art decides to address the issue that got him into this situation. He asks Virian if he has had the chance to look at Tessia's mana core. The good news is that her body is more compatible with her beast will than Art's body was with his own. But the question on Virian's mind is how Art managed to obtain an Elderwood Guardian's beast core in the first place. Art nonchalantly tells him that he got it by killing one, but it only raises more questions than it answers. 
Cynthia comes to Art's rescue by telling them that their visiting time is over. Tessia needs to be monitored and besides, there seems to be many more visitor waiting for their chance to meet Art. After his family left, he continued to get visitors throughout the day. Some came seeking answers for what happened, while others came out of concern. This included Gideon as well, who came to bring Art a new medicine he had created. Before leaving, Gideon tells him that he should stop by his training room after he has recovered. Cynthia asked him to build some training artifacts, and now that they're complete, he wants Art to try them out. He is surprised that he will be getting this for free. Regardless, it doesn't take long for Gideon to show his true intentions. Now that everyone has left, Art can finally relax. That's what he thought. Not two minutes go by and Art gets another visitor. This time, it's Tessia. It seems she has finally gathered the courage to meet him. Art starts asking her all sorts of questions about her mana core and the pain she experienced. Tessia finds this funny, that Art can still worry about her when he almost died himself. It was the same when they were kids, when he rescued her from the bandits. Art tries to move, but he still hasn't fully recovered. She becomes concerned about him. Art assures her that he is going to be fine so she can stop worrying about him. She once again apologizes to Art. He assumes that she's apologizing because he had to save her again. But that's not the case. She is making an apology for taking advantage of him. Just as she says this, she moves in and kisses him. She quickly runs out of the room from sheer embarrassment. She did it in the heat of the moment, but now she cannot be more uneasy thinking about it. All sorts of questions fill her mind. Like maybe she came on too strong and what he's going to think about her now. She even thinks about going back to the room and playing it off as a joke. But she can't be thinking like that. If she had left everything up to Art, then things would have never progressed. He still treats her like a child every time they are together, and she wanted to change that. Hence, her reason for doing what she did. She tells herself that it would be his loss if he doesn't like her back. This is an obvious attempt to cheer herself up. Nevertheless, it doesn't seem to have worked. Art, on the other hand, is left completely shocked by what just happened. One can say his concerns are a little different from Tessia's. He cannot believe that he kissed a 13-year-old girl. Does that make him a criminal now? He tries to calm himself down by telling himself that he's in the body of a 12-year-old boy, so it must be fine. As a matter of fact, in this world, children around their age get married, and besides, she was the one who kissed him. Despite all this, his teenage body seems to have been having a different reaction. Two days go by, while Art is recovering, the mana manipulation class has been suspended. Rumors have already begun flying around about the first year who's going to be the new professor of this class. Art has recovered enough to be moving around on his own, though he still needs a cane. Accompanied by Cynthia and Gideon, Art makes his way to his new training room. Tomorrow is also going to be his first day as the professor. The director asks him if he had time to prepare some material. Considering that Art got discharged from the hospital just the day before, the answer is an obvious no. He asks Cynthia about Tessia's assimilation. Because of everything that happened between them, things have gotten a little awkward. So Art cannot ask her himself. Cynthia tells him that it's been going smoothly. But soon Virian will have to go back to Eleanor. With that being the case, Art wonders who is going to take over his job now. But before he can finish the question, they are interrupted by Gideon as they have finally arrived at the training room. Gideon seems to be most excited, even though he was complaining before about how it was a waste of his time. Cynthia had only asked him to build some sturdy artifacts so Art can train, but he seems to have done a lot more than that. As soon as they enter, Art can feel the abundant mana flowing within the room. This comes as an annoyance to Gideon, who wants Art to appreciate his hard work instead of admiring the room. Gideon has built a sparing robot for Art to fight against. From the way he talks about it, one can tell how proud he is of his work. Gideon claims that this robot is the greatest addition of his training operator and blast inductor, or Toby for short. Toby is currently set to level 5 which roughly translates to a dark orange core, mana beast, or a yellow core human. But unlike a human, Toby has a solid palagonite iron body. This means that although his attacks will be on the same level as a yellow core human, his durability will be even higher. Before Gideon continues boasting about his creation, his happiness is cut short. Art steps forward and punches Toby using his magic. Despite Gideon's talk about how great Toby is, one punch from Art is all it takes for it to be destroyed. It seems Gideon didn't know how strong Art was. Elsewhere outside the Exiris city, a party of adventurers is clearing out a cave. This is a party sent by the King of Sepin. This party also includes Lucas's brother, Baron. They are investigating the monsters who have appeared in this cave. 
It's strange as they don't usually get this big. On top of that, the entrance to this cave is sealed so no one could have entered. However, Baron realizes the seriousness of this issue when he finds a piece of cloth with the symbol of one of the nations. Back at the Exiris Academy, Art has begun his training. He's engaged in a battle with the 7th edition of Toby. They go back and forth, exchanging blows. Nonetheless, as expected, Toby is still no match for Art. Despite Art's injuries, he is still making a mockery out of Gideon's greatest creation. Despite his annoyance, he still asks for Art's feedback so he can make more improvements. Firstly, Toby's joints seem to be a very big weak spot, so it needs more reinforcement. Secondly, it cannot use any elemental spells, so that's a very big offensive weakness. However, this was a design choice that Gideon made on purpose. He had assumed that Toby was going to be fighting an Augmenter, not the Devil Incarnate. Art decides to add one more thing to the list. Although it's a bit of a nuance, he wants Toby to have better mana reinforcement. This leaves both Cynthia and Gideon confused. Toby creates a layer of protective mana around his body like any normal human mage. Although it's the easiest and the fastest way a mage can protect himself, it also has a huge weakness. If the attacks are targeted at the same spot, this shield can be broken through very easily. Hence, Art makes a different suggestion. Although it's a bit more complicated and extensive, it would be better if Toby could conjure an array of individual mana plates that are interconnected with each other. This way, if the barrier is broken through, it can be repaired very easily. So instead of wasting mana conjuring up a completely new barrier, one can focus on repairing only the damaged part. Art doesn't realize how revolutionary his idea is. Everyone present is left completely stunned. Cynthia quickly rushes off to relay this to the Mage's Guild to see what they have to say. Today is also Art's first day as a professor. After all his training with Toby, he can barely walk. If he were to enter the class like this, it would surely not leave a good impression. Luckily for him, he comes across Princess Cathelm. Before he can apologize for nearly bumping into her, she takes his arm and puts it around her shoulder. She wants to help him walk to his class. Back in the class, everyone is talking about their new professor. They are all looking forward to making a fool out of the first year. Others even seem disappointed that the school is hiring first years as teachers. They are all left stunned as Art enters the class with his arm wrapped around Princess Cathelm. Even Ferith is impressed. After Princess Cathelm takes her seat, Art finally starts the lecture. He starts by introducing himself, Arthur Lewin, a member of the disciplinary committee, the son of two wonderful mages, a doting brother, and the new professor of the mana manipulation class. As expected, this is met by loud and angry boos from everyone. One student even jumps down onto the field and challenges Art to a fight. He claims that if Art can become a teacher by beating the old professor, then he can do the same. This action has the full backing of all the students. All his energy quickly dissipates as soon as Art releases his mana. The student cannot help but feel terrified. Art once again addresses the class. He tells them that whether they like it or not, the fact is that he is their new professor. He even tells them that they are free to leave if they want. In fact, he will allow them to take another class instead of this one. Regardless if they are curious about how a little boy with a limp can become a professor of the most prestigious magical academy, then he encourages them to stay. About the student who jumped onto the field, Art gives him two options. Either he can leave the class or go back to his seat. He seems to have found his manners after witnessing Art's strength. Without arguing, he quickly makes his way back to his seat. Art begins the lecture with a practical question. What is the best way to utilize mana from the surrounding atmosphere? No one seems to know the answer other than one student. She replies that the best way to utilize mana from the surrounding is to absorb it in one's mana core and use it to conjure spells. The main difference between augmenters and conjurers lies in the fact that augmenters mostly use their mana channels. Conjurers, on the other hand, use mana directly from their surroundings via their mana veins. Considering this fact, Art raises another question for the students. Why do both types of mages have to meditate and absorb mana if only the augmenters primarily utilize it and absorb it into their core? Once again, no one knows the answer except for the same girl. Although conjurers don't form physical attacks, they still need to use their mana to manipulate the one in the surroundings to form a spell. Judging from her behavior, it's obvious that this girl is a know-it-all. Art follows up her answer with another question. Since conjurers use less mana in their attacks than augmenters do then is the color of one's mana core a truly accurate way of measuring one's strength. This question leaves everyone wondering. While they keep this question in mind, Art requests six volunteers for a demonstration. 
He requires three augmenters and three conjurers. The two conjurers also include Ferith and Cathan. With everyone lined up, Art begins the demonstration. He instructs everyone to use the most basic spell of their affinity. Following the instructions, everyone quickly forms the spell on their hands. What comes next shocks the six volunteers. Art instructs the augmenters to launch the spell and conjurers to absorb the spell back into their hands. Everyone finds this absurd, as normally it's the opposite of what conjurers and augmenters are good at. Nevertheless, each volunteer tries to do as they are instructed, but they fail miserably. The only one who finds a bit of success is Cathelm. As expected, it doesn't take long for the students to get annoyed. They began to call this whole exercise stupid and question why it was even necessary. Instead of answering their question with words, Art decides to give them a practical demonstration. He fires a wind spell at the wall, but nothing special happens. No one is impressed as they don't see the point. Art fires off another spell, but this time it's much stronger. This time, everyone is left stunned to see an augmenter launch such a powerful spell. Although he cannot accurately demonstrate what happens when a conjurer absorbs their spell, he can only ask them to trust him. With this demonstration out of the way, Art encourages the whole class to come down onto the field and try this out. As the class ends, everyone is left wondering about Art's strength. They seem more invested than they were before the class. So all in all, one can call Art's first lecture as a professor a success. After the class, he is visited by Princess Cathan. From her body language, one can tell that she has something on her mind. After a while of small talk, she finally builds up the courage to speak up. Art begins to worry if Cathan is also going to profess her love for him. Luckily for him, that's not the case. She wants to apologize on behalf of her family. This is about what happened with Sebastian at the auction house all those years ago. She wants to apologize for her father's behavior as well as her brother's blunder in the alleyway. Art is surprised that she's still bothered by things that happened over four years ago. She tells him that although she looks up to her father, he disappointed her on that day. Art assures her that what happened was in the past, and she doesn't need to apologize for them. Nonetheless, she felt it was necessary, seeing how they had become friends. But her definition of a friend seems to be a little misplaced. She had grown up blaming her lineage, her magical prowess, as well as their physical appearance for robbing her freedom. So when she looks at Art, she wonders how a boy so talented, sought after, investigated, and judged, be so bright. Art's behavior gets a chuckle out of her. This is indeed a big moment, as this is the first time the literal ice princess has laughed. Embarrassed by this, Cathan quickly changes the topic. She asks Art why the outcome of the two wind bullets turned out to be so different. Art's answer is enough to cheer her up. He tells her that it would be unfair if he gave his brightest student an even bigger advantage. After his classes are over, he heads to the training room to help Tessia with her assimilation. As always, Sylvie is very excited to meet her. Things seem to be finally getting back to normal between the two of them. Assimilation with any beast takes a lot of effort, and most of the time it cannot be done alone. Oftentimes a mage with the same elemental affinity as the beast is needed to take some of the burden off the host. Being a quadra elemental mage, Art is able to use an even balance of all forms of all four elements. This not only helps Tessia with her beast will, but also strengthens her body and helps her fight against the Elderwood Guardian trying to establish control over her mana core. At the end of their session, both of them are left exhausted. Tessia finally addresses what happened between the two of them. She asks Art if he's mad at her for kissing him. He tells her that he was just surprised, but he is not mad. She follows it up with another question and asks him why he's been avoiding her then. But this is something Art cannot answer truthfully. So instead, he plays it off as a joke, telling her that they cannot get married since she's royalty, and he's a commoner. Nevertheless, this only upsets Tessia. She knows it was wrong of her to take advantage of him, but she just wanted things to progress between them. Art once again decides to joke about it since that's all he can do. This time, she gets mad. Although she didn't expect an answer from him yet, she at least wanted him to take her feelings seriously. She tells him that there are so many things he's good at, like magic, fighting, and wits but there are also things he's not good at. She reveals that the people around him do notice when he puts on a mask and pretends that he's happy and unaffected by everything that happens. She even reveals that she knows that he rejected Lilio, which comes as a surprise to Art. With that, she storms out of the room, leaving him to wonder how she even knew about it. Art is left frustrated as there is nothing he can do in this situation, as he cannot tell her about his past and how old he actually is.